Welcome to the 29th commencement of the Skaggs School of Chemical and Biological Sciences at Scripps Research. My name is Jamie Williamson. I'm the Executive Vice President here, and I am pleased to welcome all of you to our virtual commencement. This is our second virtual commencement, and hopefully it's our last. It's really difficult to recreate that air of jubilation in the auditorium and the shared joy of all of the assembled uh, families with all of the graduates present after a processional. There are many aspects of our life where we have difficulties in having the same uh, seasonal joy that we might at holidays or family gatherings. And uh, I, it actually struck me last night, I watched Jimmy Kimmel. And here's a comedian who's used to thriving off the energy of the audience having to deliver a monologue to a camera. Uh, I watched The Voice uh, and there were video screens of happily clapping people in an in a array. And, and it's all just a bit surreal. So typically I would stand here and make some inspirational remarks and tell a few jokes to get the crowd roaring and I find myself unable to find the appropriate medium to express the pride that we have for our graduates. But this has been a year of shouldering unprecedented burdens, and so we will, like so many other times that we have, abide, endure, and enjoy in the best way that we can in the moment. So for any graduate, getting to the end of your thesis is like finishing a marathon. And for any of you who have run a race, when you see the finish line, it's grit and determination to get over that line, but you know you do that with a sense of accomplishment. So for the 2021 graduates, imagine being with the finish line in sight, except it's a half mile steep uphill in 12 inches of mud, and you're wearing a mask. So the graduates from 2021 have faced unprecedented challenges in finishing, and I think they deserve a special acknowledgement of uh, performance under you know, tremendously difficult conditions. On the plus side, we're in an era where we're really reopening all of the things that we used to do, the economy is likely to recover, and I'm certain that the career opportunities for the graduates are going to be tremendous in the coming years. So I am pleased to offer heartfelt congratulations to the graduates and the families this day, and I have great pride in all of your accomplishments. I'd like to introduce Dean Phil Dawson, for his remarks. Thank you, Jamie. Welcome, everyone, to our students, their families and friends, faculty members, and other supporters of our Skaggs Graduate School of Chemical and Biological Sciences. This is a special day in which you have each played a critical role. I'm Phil Dawson, Dean of the Graduate Program and a professor in the Department of Chemistry here at Scripps Research. As many of you know, the Graduate School was envisioned and founded by Scripps Research faculty back in 1989 because we believe strongly in educating and training the next generation of scientists to the most rigorous standards. Many of the students who are graduating today will take the research tools they have developed in Scripps Labs and use them to build their own research programs, leading to remarkable discoveries throughout their careers. Others will explore entirely divergent paths and make their impact in business, finance, government, and communication. Regardless of the career path, the dedication and excellence and in independent thinking that we value at Scripps will serve them well as they leave to make their mark on the world. Pursuing scientific discovery during a pandemic has had its challenges, and I commend every student who willingly took on the late night or early morning shift in the lab, who wrote up lab notes in the kitchen counter or, computer, uh, or computed data amidst the noise of children, pets, and family. Despite these hurdles, you have succeeded in carrying science forward. 
Importantly for many Scripps students, the pandemic also radically changed the focus of the thesis work that they did as they did a pivot towards better understanding the coronavirus and exploiting those insights towards the development of therapies, vaccines, and analyses of the spread of the virus. During the ceremony, our faculty will individually introduce the graduates and highlight their groundbreaking research. You will hear about students who developed the chemical transformations that have promised to open up new avenues for drug discovery and manufacture. Other students have made their fundamental advances in our understanding of biological systems, such as those that underpin how we sense the environment or fight disease. Every year I find these individual stories of creativity and perseverance deeply inspiring. While there are many metrics of success, publications are the primary way that we communicate our achievements to the outside world. I have freshly calculated publication data, and I'm pleased to report that the 41 students graduating today have collectively published 185 manuscripts. This is an astonishing output, since I suspect many of our graduate students have a paper or three still in the draft stage. These papers communicate in the world's most prestigious journals and will be highlighted by our fa faculty in their introductions. Another outstanding statistic is that these papers, many of which have only been impressed for a matter of months, have been cited 5,153 times. While it is important to publish, it is also important that someone actually reads those papers and learns something important from the findings described therein. When we publish our papers, we acknowledge the work upon which we built our own studies through citation. One way, although imperfect, that our journals are evaluated is by the average number of citations that their papers get in the first years following publication an impact factor. Top journals, for an impact, top journals aim for an impact factor of over 10, and the glossy magazine journals are often in the 20s. I'm pleased to report that the impact factor of the Journal of the Scripps Class of 2021 is a stunning 28. Graduate school can be a period of extreme highs and lows. I would especially like to thank the graduate staff for their tireless efforts to facilitate every aspect of the graduate experience. Their dedication and support are critical for the success of our program. I am grateful to the continuing support of the Skaggs family and their commitment to endowing the graduate student fellowships. I'm grateful as well to all those generous individuals, including many members of our faculty, who have added their support to our endowed fellowships campaign. I'm proud to have the privilege of leading the graduate program here at our institute. Our graduating students are already changing the world for the better. Parents, you should be very proud. Everyone else in the audience, you should be very grateful. Now let's proceed to the awarding of the doctoral degrees to a very worthy class of students of science. And now I'd like to introduce Pete Schultz, President and CEO of Scripps Research. Uh, thanks, Phil, for that kind introduction. Um, I'd like to start out by welcoming, welcoming the graduating class of, of 2021. Congratulations. And also welcoming their parents and, and family and friends um, to, to what I hope to be our last virtual graduation ceremony. Uh, unfortunately, we can't all be here in person to celebrate your achievements, but uh, we do have the advantage that everybody can zoom in um, and actually toast the candidates uh, while they're receiving their degree. Um, uh, it's been really an extraordinary year. Uh, with a pandemic that's, that's affected almost every living person on the planet. It's also been extraordinary in the uh, response of the global scientific community to that pandemic and, and meeting the challenge and I think beginning to overcome the challenge of the pandemic. Um, and, and therein lies my brief message to the graduating class. Um, you've had the opportunity to have a remarkable education um, as undergraduates and now graduates at Scripps um, and, and going on to a career where you continue, somebody pays you to continue to learn and explore the mysteries of life in the universe. Um, but not everyone has been that fortunate. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I took a year off from Caltech my junior year because I didn't quite get the value of the education I was receiving. Uh, and I worked uh, night shifts in a foundry pouring metal and shaking out sand castings, which was pretty 
hot and hard work. But I met a lot of really decent people, hardworking people and very thoughtful people there who didn't have the same educational opportunities as I did and who pretty much are going to spend the entirety of, uh, of their lives doing that same job. And all of us are far more fortunate than that and we're privileged to have remarkable educations but I would like to argue with that privilege comes an obligation to give back um, and to give back to those less fortunate than you and I think if you always keep that in mind um, throughout your career of giving back when you actually look back on your career that'll probably be one of the most rewarding thoughts you'll have <clears throat> So, uh, with that theme in mind, I'd like to um, uh, introduce uh, our graduation commencement speaker, uh, Dr. Tom Daniel, who's, who's a good friend and colleague of mine. Um, Tom uh, received his MD from uh, UT Southwestern and then went on to a residency at Mass General and be began his academic career um, at Vanderbilt um, teaching, um, seeing patients, and, and doing research. And he also became director of the uh, Center for Vascular Biology. But Tom, um, after doing that for almost 15 years, I think was frustrated in the, the impact scientific progress was having directly on the patients he was seeing, and he decided like Tom to, to, you know, vote with his own two feet and do something about it himself. So he decided to take some of his discoveries and, and joined um, a, a really successful biotech company in, in Seattle, Immunex, um, on their leadership team. Um, and, and from there, he wanna, went on to leadership positions um, in biotech and the pharmaceutical industry at, at Amgen, at Ambrix, and, and most recently at Celgene, um, where in the latter position, he, he actually also pioneered a, a new kind of business development model that, that really facilitated interactions between big pharma and biotechs. So with all of that, Tom actually did have a big impact on patients with, with advancing uh, a number of, of new drugs for inflammation and for cancer um, all the way through clinical trials. Um, Tom is now a venture partner at Arch and he serves on the boards of, of many uh, biotech startups, including some out of Scripps, um, uh, helping them through his experience and insights and wisdom to uh, uh, successfully translate their ideas to, to new medicines. Tom also serves on as the chairman of our board of overseers, which is an advisory group that, that really gives Scripps a lot of terrific advice about how to advance its, its um, basic research and translational agendas. And, and mo most recently, he's now also on the board of directors um, at Scripps. So he's, he's giving back in many ways, not only to the, the entire community, but also uh, to many of us here at Scripps, and we're very much in his debt. Um, so without further ado, um, Tom. Good morning, Pete, board of directors, faculty, parents, friends, and most importantly, graduating students. I'm deeply honored to speak to you today at this moment of transition as you complete your graduate studies and embark on the next phase of your careers. I'm also challenged to, stay, to say something that you might remember, or even more challenging, to give you a message of value for your career ahead. My career's had so many different stages that transitions are something I can speak to. I'll share a couple of illustrative stories that describe patterns for success that I hope you will find useful. Now, you should be skeptical about stories from someone who appears to have had professional attention deficit disorder. But I hope to address your skepticism with this simple truth. Your career will have transitions, and the quality of your decisions around them will define your contribution. So I have two simple messages today. Focus on transitions 
and pursue patterns of success. As I begin, I want to acknowledge the special niche Scripps Research holds in the future of biomedical research. Your scientific contributions reflected in the presentations today are highly motivating for me and speak volumes about your potential. I first appreciated the power of this institute to forge exceptional science and scientists 18 years ago as Pete recruited me to help start the company Ambrix. When I first met with his graduate students over their data that enabled chemical engineering of therapeutic proteins. From that beginning, Scripps has been a generator of great science and great scientists, many of whom have joined companies and discovered impactful products I've been privileged to work on. Beyond this exceptional team that we hired at Ambrix, Scripps scientists led by Phil Chamberlain and others transformed cell genes research, defining a completely new mechanism for drug action, the chemical engagement of tagging machinery that causes degradation of new drug targets. That work explained the actions of thalidomide, advanced development of transformative medicines in hematologic cancer, and discovered new drug candidates now in development. In addition to Scripps' work of Hugh Rosen, Ed Roberts, and colleagues, enabled the success of Ozanamod and led to Receptos' acquisition by Celgene. Over the past five years, I've had the distinct privilege to bring Arch Ventures funding to advance therapeutic potential of science from Ben Cravat, Phil Barron, and Jen Kwan Yu at, at Vividian, and of Gene Loring at Aspen Neurosciences. So as you can appreciate, I've been an observer, a participant, and an enthusiast for what Scripps Research is delivering to progress biomedical science. I anticipate even greater contributions from you and your colleagues and look forward to following the impact of your work. Now to focus on the theme of transitions and the motivation and energy that drives them, I'll, I'll turn to my favorite interview method, which is to ask applicants why they move from one career stop to the next. Since these stories are telling, I'll share a part of my story. As an oldest child at age 15 years, my father came to the brink of dying from coronary disease, an event that pushed me into medicine. Dad was the eighth coronary bypass case done in Dallas, Texas in 1968, and was given terrible odds for survival. Yet because of new surgical techniques, drugs, pacemakers, and antibiotics, he lived to age 85 to attend my daughter's high school graduation. Again and again, medicine stayed a half step ahead of what dad needed for 42 years to keep my family intact. For me, the urgency of applying science to medicine is very personal. Timing of progress matters. During decades of medical practice, I watched new drugs save patients that would have been lost if they presented months earlier. In fact, lenalidomide, a drug our teams developed, saved my sister and added over a decade to survival and quality of life for hundreds of thousands of patients. It's true, patients are waiting. So I want, this kind of urgency has never been even more personal than during the current pandemic. Nations, communities, families, and individuals have had to pause their lives and jobs to watch loved ones die while awaiting effective vaccines. Biomedical science has truly delivered, but society at large does not yet grasp how fortunate we've been this time. Four elements converge to deliver this success. And as, as I share the inside story, I hope you will tease them out and appreciate that each was required. My friend and former Vanderbilt colleague, Barney Graham, of the Vaccine Research Center in Bethesda and his lab played a central role at the nexus of the, select, of the successful COVID-19 vaccine response. For decades, Barney studied antibodies and vaccines to respiratory syncytial virus, the most common cause of hospitalization of children under five. With postdoc Jason McClellan, his lab acquired deep understanding of the structural biology and 
key, the no neutralization sensitive epitopes of the RSVF protein, both in its functional prefusion and in the non-functional post-fusion conformations. Now, the, the RSVF protein is analogous to the S or spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. Secondly, Barney and his colleagues established a pandemic pathogen preparedness collaboration project between the VCR, VRC and Moderna, focused initially on a different virus, Nipah. Third, through their work on the coronavirus MERS in the earlier outbreak, they had found substitutions that stabilized the functional prefusion forms of the S protein of the common cold coronavirus HK1. And they had developed capability to rapidly assess by cryo-EM and other methods which substitutions would stabilize the key epitopes of the SARS-CoV-2 S protein to evoke neutralizing antibodies. In other words, they'd stacked the deck with deep understanding and extrapolation from relevant model systems. With these capabilities, insights, and history, on January 10th, when Chinese scientists released the SARS-CoV-2 sequences, but before it was clear that COVID-19 would be a pandemic, Barney and Stefan Bensel, Moderna's CEO, made the bold anticipatory move to pivot from Nipah virus to SARS-CoV-2, anticipating that this was no drill. The redirected collaboration between VRC and Moderna's emerging nanoparticle mRNA technology yielded an mRNA vaccine prototype that, that was in the form of clinical material for testing 42 days later and that entered clinical studies 23 days after that, unprecedented accelerated delivery. Barney also advised BioNTech CEO Ugur Sahin about the epitope stabilization approach to antigen that they too pursued, leading ultimately to the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. As of last week, Moderna has made 94 million doses available and Pfizer BioNTech 106 million. Now, the world has mRNA-based vaccines with unprecedented efficacy deployed in record time with a completely new technology platform. That describes urgency delivered. So, what were the four elements that contributed to this rapid success? There's a, they're the same elements I look for as an advisor and an investor in companies capable of high impact. They are, one, basic science insights framed by clinical perspective. Two, cross-disciplinary collaboration and trust. Three, preparation, anticipatory risk-taking, and a willingness to pivot. And fourth, technological innovation. Under strong leadership and in a robust scientific culture, these four elements are the secret sauce, the formula for success. It's a pattern. Remember it well. So in deciding to make career transitions, one simple guiding principle has served me very well. Pursue the question that speaks to you and acquire the new tools you need to pursue it. Be willing to avoid the comfort of the well-paved roads to discover new territory. During my training to be an academic kidney specialist, after six months in the lab, I disappointed my nephrology mentors by leaving behind the paved path I was on in kidney research to act on my conviction that molecular genetics would change medicine. That move transformed my capacity to contribute. I was deeply fortunate to postdoc with Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein as the molecular genetics of the LDL receptor story was emerging. There I witnessed one of the world's most powerful scientific collaborations in action. Their partnership, lacking attribution of who contributed what idea, has now lasted for almost 50 years and has spawned science reflected in Thomas Sudoff's Nobel Prize, Helen Hobbs' Breakthrough Award, both of whom were postdoc lab mates of mine, to name only a few of my more famous contemporaries. 
Reflecting back, I think as or perhaps even more important than the science and methods I learned there was the culture I experienced. I was imprinted with the profound power of different scientific perspectives converging on a, on a critical problem. I observed fearless exploration of emerging technologies across many fields in search of better methods to answer the most important next key question. And I acquired skills for penetrating evaluation of data, not just the data that fit the current hypothesis, but especially what didn't fit about the data. I learned the power of anomalous results <coughs> to challenge current scientific dogma. I encourage you, perhaps I even challenge you, to seek, to find, and to create exceptional collaborative cultures that have these attributes. <coughs> so among the, the, the final story today is of the deepest and most rewarding collaboration in my professional career. The partnership with George Golombeski head of business development at Celgene. As head of R&D, I was faced with a profoundly narrow pipeline, a small discovery effort, and expanding expectations. Rather than build a larger research organization, I had a deep commitment to innovative power of small, committed research groups, in part from my Ambrix experience. So I envisioned a distributed research organization, a sort of federation of small, innovative teams. In 2008, when George took the BD leadership role at Celgene, I found in him a kindred spirit, an excellent scientist with deep experience in deals and a creative attitude toward business development. We had both led startup companies and both worked in larger, larger corporations. Over eight years, our collaboration forged construction of a distributed research model organization that incentivized multiple small companies to collaborate with Celgene, yet to still control their science and their fate while dramatically expanding our pipeline. Partner companies included Agios, Juno, Epizyme, Forma, and many others. What was unique in our ecosystem? True collaboration between George and me in forging win-win deal structures, between scientists in my organization and business development colleagues in his, and in influential but non-controlling scientific partnerships with our smaller company collaborators. I'm told that the model was studied throughout pharma, has seen wide adoption, and I believe has opened creative avenues for intercompany collaboration, all just reinforcing the power of collaboration in teams with common dis objectives. Before I close, Pete asked me to consider a future vision what I believe is possible, what should we, working, we be working toward together, and what do I hope to see in our application of science for humanity in upcoming years? I'll share my bucket wish list. One, redirecting biomedical science into problem-solving team science, advanced by collaboration and cultural excellence. Integrating collective intelligence that spans far beyond one or two investigators or disciplines. Two, effective application of technology in anticipatory disease risk def definition, in disease prevention, and in early diagnosis and intervention, like that enabled now by Grail's liquid biopsy early diagnosis of cancer. Three, safer and more effective cellular transplantation to reconstitute unhealthy immune systems, to replace damaged tissues, and to affect correction of genetic diseases as BEAM is conducting. And then finally, <laughs> rapid response capability to the inevitable infectious threats ahead, including host response directed therapies. This pandemic and our collective scientific response has revitalized society's view of the value that science applied to prevention and therapies can have. Life science private financing is at record levels and deal size is increasing. Based on the pattern through 2020, the industry is on track for $18 billion worth of capital financing in 2021, up from 14 billion last year. 
This is three times the investment five years ago. While the drive to privately finance applied science is unprecedented, there is high urgency to deliver biomedical advances back to society for these investments. In closing, as you focus on transitions and pursue patterns for success, recall how fortunate we are to be engaged in a noble enterprise with the tools to change outcomes for patients, society, and humanity. I've been uncommonly fortunate getting to help discover and develop impactful drugs, to work with exceptional scientists, and to advance collaboration efforts across the industry. I feel gratitude and impatience. Gratitude that we get to use our minds and scientific tools to serve humanity, and impatience to realize the promise of what we can do collectively together. Thank you for the chance to speak today. As a favorite mentor once guided me, go out and change the world. I'll add to that and be grateful you can do it with science. Politics is difficult. Thank you. Well, thanks, Tom, for that really um, inspirational message to the graduating class. And I'd like to now have the faculty present the 2021 graduating class. And we'll start out um, with Christian Anderson. Christian. Hi, everybody. My name is Christian Anderson. I'm a professor in the Department of Immunology and Microbiology. I'm here today to congratulate Kartik Gangarabu. Kartik was the first graduate student in the Anderson lab and is also the first student to leave the lab or graduate from the lab. Kartik came just a few months after I came here to Scripps in 2015, and most of his work has been computational work focusing on viruses, understanding the spread, understanding the spread transmission, and understanding the evolution. A lot of that has been employed, deployed to many, understanding many very important viruses like SARS-CoV-2, but also viruses like Zika and West Nile. For a lot of this work, Kartik has produced a tremendous amount of very high impact uh, articles published both in Cell, in Nature, and in Science, as well as a couple of other decent enough journals. He has a couple of things still to wrap up, and I'm pretty sure that some of those will also go into some really good journals. So Kartik has been in extremely productive here, and I'm happy to say that Kartik will continue his postdoc with one of our very good collaborators at UCLA, and I'm really excited to see what Kartik can do in Mark Sushat's lab, who's there who's much more on the mathematical side and the statistical side, which is the typical thing of Kartik that he wants to challenge himself when he wants to try something new. And his postdoc will certainly do that, and luckily we'll get an opportunity to continue to work with him. So I really want to congratulate Kartik. I think you all should do. He has done a tremendous amount of work, has been extremely productive in, in my lab, and I'm li really looking forward to seeing how he'll do in the future. My professors, Christian and Andrew, and the research environment at Scripps always encouraged me to think independently and allowed me to experiment with my own ideas. Uh, this contributed significantly towards improving my skill set. After graduation, I'll be starting a postdoctoral position studying phylogenetics with Professor Mark Suchard at UCLA. Hi, I'm Phil Barron, and I'm in the Department of Chemistry. Today, I have the honor of introducing four exceptional scientists. Collectively, they spent about 15 years in my lab, gave over 48 hours of group meeting presentations, published more than a dozen papers, won numerous prestigious awards and fellowships, and now have begun illustrious careers in biomedical science. Lisa Barton was born in Boston and received her undergraduate education at Northeastern University. She dreamed of making medicines from an early age, and by the time she arrived in Scripps, she had already amassed undergraduate research experience in medicinal chemistry within the Manesh lab and through several internships at Millennium Pharmaceuticals, Cubis, and Bistera. Lisa's approach to graduate school was bold and fearless and explosively productive. For her starter project, she co-led a team of scientists to invent the first method for swapping the most common functional group in organic chemistry, a carboxylic acid, for an exotic veronic acid. This work, published in Science, was done in collaboration with Caliber leading to a patent, a potential lead for the treatment of cystic fibrosis, and has already been cited hundreds of times. For her next project, published in Nature, she led a team to create, take one of the oldest and most useful reactions, the Diels Alder, and bring it into the modern era by marrying it to radical cross-coupling chemistry, enabling access to a vast area of new chemical space. She spearheaded a project funded by DARPA and the Army, 
to show that stereochemistry and regiochemistry matter in the synthesis of energetic materials, blasting away dogma that had existed in the field for decades. Finally, she completed the synthesis of an exotic natural product named Jazomycin, bearing so many strain cyclopropane rings that it resembles sharks' teeth by inventing a new electrochemical method for its rapid construction. When I think of Lisa, her incredible can-do attitude and fearless approach to research are what I will always remember. Not surprisingly, Lisa broke the hearts of many pharmaceutical companies that tried to recruit her, and she has officially accepted an offer at Genentech, where she will be leading the way in making medicines of the future. Congratulations, Lisa. The last five years at Scripps have been so amazing. I've had such a wonderful advisor in Phil, who's just really been an incredible mentor these last five years. I've also made friendships that will last a lifetime. And of course, I have to thank my family, who've just been so supportive of me throughout my entire PhD research. Kyle McClement hails from Ottawa. And after obtaining his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Ottawa, he came to Scripps in 2015. From the moment he joined the lab, he demonstrated the bold independence and maturity of a postdoctoral scholar rather than a graduate student. For his warm-up project published in Nature, he co-led a team of chemists on a new and versatile method to synthesize one of the most useful functional groups in organic chemistry, the olefin. For his remaining time in the lab, he spearheaded a chemical synthesis of the anti-cancer natural product Maximycin, produced in Nature through a complex series of biochemical reactions bridging completely unrelated enzymatic networks. He wanted to maximize simplicity and as a consequence his approach was bold and ambitious, uncovering hidden symmetry and allowing him to start from a simple benzene derivative. His root features a remarkable CH activation of a single prochiral methyl group that set four stereo centers through desymmetrization followed by a remarkable radical cascade to install the remaining carbon atoms with the correct oxidation state in a kind of chemical Cirque du Soleil. His journey was fraught with one failure after another, yet he persevered and never showed any signs of discouragement. The final outcome of his extraordinary efforts was published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society and was amongst the top three downloaded papers of the year and was covered on several blogs and YouTube videos. When I think of Kyle, I'll always remember his cool and calm exterior demeanor, hiding the ferocious and brilliant chemist within. Like Lisa, he had many options before him and he chose to join the medicinal chemistry department at Merck where he is inventing new medicines in the area of cardiometabolic disease. Congratulations, Kyle. My experience at Scripps was incredible. Uh, it was an amazing five years, which I'm really appreciative for. Uh, met a lot of really cool people, made friendships that will last a lifetime, uh, and did some really incredible science. Uh, I was pushed to my limit intellectually, physically, at the gym with Rocky. Um, and I wouldn't say emotionally, I had a pretty good time. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I have to say Phil was an incredible mentor, supervisor. I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot about how to be creative and synthesis um, to push the limits of what, you know, we think is possible and just go for it. Uh, and yeah, he was a really awesome advisor, um, but someone that I learned a lot from. And in terms of, uh, you know, family and friends, I mean, my family was so supportive over the whole time. Uh, you know, I, I love them and I really appreciate everything mom, dad, Kelsey, that you did to, to support me and sort of, you know, help keep me going during the PhD and also all my friends, both in San Diego and back home. Saul Reisberg, who came to Scripps with a most unusual background, obtained his PhD in less than three years, perhaps a record for the Institute. He was born in Portland, Oregon, and after skipping several grades in his younger years and graduating from Kenyon College early, while simultaneously conducting extensive research, he pursued his passion in pharmaceutical science. First, he took advantage of his minor in mathematics to help launch Schrodinger. At the time, a smaller company seeking to merge computation with medicinal chemistry in new ways, and now a NASDAQ-listed billion-dollar company. Within three years, he became a senior director, leading a team of over 40 people overseeing aspects of both business development and software design. He gave up this cushy position and returned to his passion in synthesis and medicine by taking up an entry-level position at Gilead before arriving at Scripps in 2017. By the time he arrived in my lab, he had already had three co-developed compounds that were either commercially approved or in clinical development, including one from his brief stay at Gilead, one from Schrodinger, and one from a summer internship at Dow. His progress at Scripps was similarly accelerated. In his free time, he worked on 
reductive and oxidative electrochemical methods that were published in Science and Nature, respectively. For his main project, he selected a bizarre, twisted natural product whose synthesis led to the de demystification of a new type of chirality never seen before in a small molecule, again published in Science. Working with Saul was definitely like working with a colleague, but a much smarter and more talented one. And it was a joy to collaborate with him. When I reminisce about Saul, aside from the joy and wonder of working with a genius, I think about his good nature, great sense of humor, and his striking wisdom. One of the, of the many options available to Saul, he chose to become a senior associate and program lead at Third Rock Ventures, where he is involved in building multiple companies across a spectrum of therapeutic areas. Congratulations, Saul. Tom Stratton, a New Jersey native, is another student with a remarkable background who came to us via Rutgers University. We all like to think of our students as rock stars, and they are in their own way. But before arriving at Scripps, Tom was literally just that. He started a successful band who got a record deal with Universal, toured extensively, sold tens of thousands of records, became a studio producer and music educator, and eventually co-founded his own restaurant and nightclub. Tom was courageous enough to walk away from all of that to pursue a career in medicine. And along the way, he realized he didn't want to prescribe them, he wanted to invent them. Realizing that the only way to invent medicines is to master organic chemistry, he became singularly obsessed with the, this goal. He arrived at Scripps and co-led teams to complete the synthesis of two of the most diabolically challenging natural products we have ever worked on, both of which were 40-year unanswered challenges in the field. The first of these was a strained alkaloid named Herculean, aptly named due to the Herculean effort needed to navigate the many setbacks associated with stitching together its two contorted tyrosine residues into the necessary cyclophane macrocyclic structure. The second of these was a potent RNA polymerase inhibitor named Tagetotoxin, or Tagetotoxin, featuring a highly oxidized carbon skeleton with more heteroatoms than carbon atoms and more polarity than table salt. Tom's relentless effort and his gift for bringing out the best in his co-workers led to the first synthesis of this exciting natural product and its full structural characterization. Working with Tom was such a delight due to his incredible maturity, wonderful optimism, and insatiable desire to learn. While his days as a rock star may be behind him, the best is yet to come, as he began his new career at Gilead where he's working on meeting the increasing demand for potent antiviral compounds. Congratulations, Tom. So my favorite part about the Scripps Graduate School experience was that it was so practical and focused. Um, my very first day uh, at being a Scripps grad student, I was running an experiment, and the same was true for my very last day. Uh, and nothing can prepare you for uh, you know, a career in, in science like that. Um, to Phil, um, just thanks for taking a chance on me and for leveling with me, um, you know, all throughout, and you know, and obviously for teaching me all that you have and all that you continue to teach me. I'm just so grateful for that. And then uh, finally, I would love to send my love to my family and my friends back home in New Jersey on the East Coast, and then also the amazing friends that I've made here. Um, a lot of them through Scripps, uh, just speaks to the community that it is. And of course, to the Tobaverse, uh, to Jesse and, and Big T here, my weirdo treasures. My name is Dale Boger, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next graduate, Kevin Litwin. Kevin received his BS in biochemistry cum laude from Ithaca College, where he worked with Scott Ulrich, culminating in an undergraduate thesis entitled Elucidating the Enzymatic Mechanism of Epiisozazane Synthase enlisting stable ASA analogs of proposed terpene carbocation intermediates that he prepared to study uh, the enzyme with, as well as a mutational analysis of the enzyme that he conducted with the Christiansen Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. In addition to his dissertation, a beautiful paper uh, in biochemistry resulted from these efforts. Consequently, we were thrilled when Kevin joined Scripps, where he spent the initial years in the program with Dennis Wolin, characterizing and ultimately working to inhibit capases, an integral part of his dissertation. 
He later joined our group and as part of our collaboration with Ben Cravat, uh, Kevin initiated our efforts to selectively target protein active site and key surface cysteines, exploring um, and then enlisting atypical thiophilic electrophiles. In these efforts, Kevin discovered a new and sure to be widely used selective cysteine labeling agent, an omethylimidate, and new targets that was alkylated by this group. In addition, and among his outside interests, Kevin has been an integral member of the San Diego Mountain Rescue Team, coordinating their training, and has worked with local law enforcement to search for missing persons. Upon completion of his dissertation in defense, Kevin joined Tanabe here in San Diego last month. Congratulations, Kevin. Cody is the first MD-PhD student graduating from the Florida campus, and he set a very high standard for the program. Um, it is sad that he has to leave now, but I'm very proud that he has accomplished uh, four years of uh, outstanding, solid work. He was a great, uh, a great student. He was uh, smart, hardworking, and very responsible. And he was also excellent in problem solving. And Cody was also fun. Um, he had a hobby, he has a hobby, and he has these beetles as his pets. So he raised the beetles and they made it and they had the babies. And Cody learned that um, before eggs hatch, they have to be separated. Otherwise, after hatching, they might eat one another. So as a problem solver, what did he do? He brought um, beetles, I mean, beetles eggs to work. And he placed them in six well plates, one per well, and he put the plates in a drawer in the office. And that story ended with um, his, one of his uh, office mates freaking out when she opened the drawer. Um, and I just want to add one thing that is, I know for sure that Cody is going to be an outstanding physician. And the, maybe the best way I can say is that I want, to, want him, Cody, to be my physician. Um, we are going to miss him a lot, and probably even his in insect larvae. First of all, I'd like to say congratulations to all of my colleagues graduating this year. My time at the Scripps Research Institute has been nothing short of incredible, and I am so happy to celebrate virtually with everyone. I want to thank my classmates in Florida and California, the members of my lab, my advisor, Dr. Haryan Che, and my thesis committee, Mark Sundred, Christoph Rader, and Bruce Torbett, in addition to my informal co-mentor, Mike Parzian. Although I'm leaving Scripps, I look forward to keeping in touch with everybody here who has made such a significant impact on my training. I also wish to thank my friends outside of Scripps, my family, and my partner, Mitch Gray. Good morning. My name is Bruno Conti. I'm a professor in the Department of Molecular Medicine and Neurosciences. And I'm here today to honor Carlos Aguirre and his achievement. Carlos joined my laboratory as a rotation student, and I was lucky to have a, the opportunity to mentor him. For his PhD, Carlos took up the task of characterizing the biology of a novel pathway involved in Parkinson's disease. He worked tirelessly, taking up every challenge and showing a remarkable determination and stamina in facing the many failures that are so much a component of a scientific research. He also displayed impeccable ethical attitude throughout the entire project. Overcoming the obstacles, Carlos identified and characterized two rare genetic variants in genes that regulate inflammation from individuals diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's disease. His work brought us closer to understand the mechanism by which inflammation contributes to this neurodegenerative disease. Carlos presented his findings at scientific meetings and author or co-author four scientific publications during his PhD. Uh, internship. He also won the People's Choice Best Posters at the Scripps Research Symposium, Engaging a Community, and he was also awarded the Translational TL1 Pre-Doctoral Training Program Fellowship. 
In addition to his work in the lab, Carlos was also actively involved in the scientific community, promoting science and fostering future scientists. From 2016 to 2020, he served as a volunteer coordinator on the Scripps Research Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship, a program called SURF. There, he mentored several graduates, uh, undergraduate students. He also participated in the North County San Diego Professional and Interdisciplinary Research Enrichment a program called INSPIRE, which actually is aimed at inspiring the next generation of scientists. It's a program that reached out to hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, students and faculty in, uh, in the country. He also worked with the Scripps Research Community Teaching Lab. He received several honors. As I said, he uh, received a TL1 fellowship, but he also was uh, awarded a scholarship of achievement rewards for college scientists. Since 12, 2012, Carlos is also a proud member of the Society for Advancement of Chicano and Hispanics and Native American in Science. Carlos now works at NASA as a NASA Internship Program Coordinator. We count on him to research extraterrestrial life. It was a pleasure to work with Carlos. And if I am very proud of him, you can imagine how proud his family is. In fact, Carlos is the first college graduate and first PhD in his family. Congratulations, Dr. Aguirre. Well done. I had a very enriching experience at Scripps Research. I gained a lot of professional development in both STEM research and STEM community engagement and outreach. I'd like to give a big thank you to the following people. First off, Dr. Bruno Conti, my advisor and mentor. Thank you very much for all the support and advice you have given me. You're an amazing person. Thank you to all my committee members for your time and support. Thank you to the ARCS Foundation. Thank you very much for the ARCS Scholarship. And thank you, Tammy, for your support. I'd also like to thank the TL1 program. I enjoyed being a TL1 fellow. Thank you to all the graduate office staff. And a very special thank you to my family and friends. I am Ben Cravat from the Department of Chemistry on the La Jolla campus, and it is my pleasure to congratulate Yujio Wang, who performed his thesis work in our lab. Yujio was born in Lanzhou, the capital city of Gansu province in northwest China. He completed his Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry and Biology at Tsinghua University in Beijing. His undergraduate research focused on the chemical synthesis of macrocyclic peptides and proteins of therapeutic agents. Inspired by the strength of chemical biology at Scripps Research, as well as the incredible views of La Jolla, he decided to venture to the United States to pursue his PhD degree. In our lab, UGIA pioneered an innovative chemical proteomic approach that leverages the fundamental principle of stereochemistry-dependent interactions to greatly enhance our understanding of small molecule protein binding events in cells. UGIA's work has identified the first ligands for many dozens of human proteins, including those that play important roles in disease and have historically been considered undruggable. The platforms established by UGIA have impacted not only how our lab, but the broader research community seeks to discover small molecule binders to proteins. Beyond his scientific achievements, UGA has been a wonderful member of our group, always showing an innate curiosity and willingness to assist others in their research. UGA is currently a postdoctoral fellow in David Baker's laboratory at the University of Washington, where he is pioneering new strategies for protein design. Once more, I offer my warmest congratulations to UGA on this very special occasion. It is my great honor and pleasure to join the virtual ceremony I will not make it here without guidance and support of many brilliant and wonderful people. First of all, I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Ben Kravat, for always being patient and encouraging over these years. Ben never ceases to miss me by his ability to ask sharp scientific questions and design decisive experiments to address them. It is truly my great honor to be a member of the lab. I would like to also extend my gratitude to my committee members for their insightful input of my research. Also, I would like to thank everyone in the lab, as well as my collaborators and colleagues at Scripps. I have learned so much from you guys, and I have made many friends as a grad school of Scripps. Moreover, I'm deeply grateful for my friends and family for their love and support throughout my PhD. Finally, I'm fortunate to have my fiance Jingyi in my life. Hi, I'm Phil Dawson. It is a pleasure to introduce Dylan Flood, a local kid from Encinitas who was raised with a strong work ethic, natural curiosity, 
and fitting for a SoCal boy, a love for surfing. Dylan studied chemistry at Berkeley, where he discovered the scientific playground, the molecular foundry. Working with Ron Zuckerman, himself one of the first grad students of our president, Dylan worked on developing biomimetic nanosheets for applications in energy and biotechnology. It has been a true pleasure to mentor Dylan during his research in my lab. Dylan's research has been broad and influential, beginning with the addressing of the challenge of chemically converting natural, the natural backbone of uh, biologically expressed proteins um, into unnatural turn structures. While conducting these, stu stu <laughs> these studies, Dylan made two important observations. First of which he developed into a new bioconjugation approach based on a selenonium link with amino acid sel selenomethionine. The second observation led him to develop an entirely new platform for chemically modifying biological macromolecules, including DNA. Dylan first applied his talents to tackle longstanding challenges in the DNA, uh, in DNA encoded libraries, uh, a field invented at uh, Scripps by Richard Lerner in 1992. Working closely with the Barron Lab, Dylan published a classic series of papers that demonstrate that natural DNA can be chemically manipulated as if it were a monofunctional small molecule rather than the highly functional uh, carrier of uh, the genetic information. The methods that Dylan created, known by acronyms such as RAS and SENDER, are likely to become established in the years to come. So far, his work has been published over the course of nine papers and three reviews, including three in JAKS, three in Angavante Chemie, uh, one each in ACS Central Science and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Notably, seven of these publications listed Dylan as the first author. Dylan's achievements have been recognized by fellowships from the Translational Science Institute and the highly competitive BMS uh, Fellowship in Synthetic Organic Chemistry. For his next act, Dylan will join his friend Kyle as co-founders of a biotech company here in San Diego that aims to revolutionize the way oligonucleotides are applied in medicine. When not surfing, Dylan might be found on the slopes as part of the ski patrol. Dylan is joined by his mother, Lily, father, Drew, and brother, Mason, and a host of uh, extended family members. Congratulations, Dylan. It's a pleasure to introduce Sydney Morris. Sydney re received her BS in chemistry from George Washington University as a student athlete, also competing in Division I soccer. During the summer of her junior year, she came to, here to Scripps as a SURF, a summer undergraduate research fellowship in the lab of Ram Krishnamurthy, who later became her thesis uh, committee chair. During the summer, Sydney worked on the origins of life chemistry, including the synthesis of DNA with an unnatural sugar backbone. During this time, Sydney also learned, first learned about the unnatural base pair research going on in the Romsberg lab. The Scripps SURF program was successful scientifically and also for recruitment, as she returned to Scripps as an NSF graduate fellow, where she first investigated DNA polymerase recognition of the unnatural base pair and then moved on to explore creation of eukaryotic semi-synthetic organisms. In particular, strategies for delivering and the required unnatural triphosphates into mammalian cells for unnatural base pair repl replication. It's been a pleasure to host Sydney in my lab to complete her thesis, which she defended this year entitled, Chemical Insights into Unnatural Nucleotides that Expand the Genetic Alphabet and Code of Living Cells. Sydney is joined today by her mom, Robin, and sisters, Courtney and Alexis. Sydney has now joined Cello Health in uh, Boston, where she's putting her diverse talents towards working with early stage biotech companies to maximize the likelihood of bringing drugs to patients with uh, high unmet medical needs. More specifically, she will be helping companies with their corporate growth strategy, disease area selection across high interest therapeutic areas, including oncology, central nervous system, autoimmune, and inflammatory diseases. She will work with indication prioritization, early market access strategy, and early value profile development. A truly interdisciplinary job description for a multi-talented and remarkable student. My experience as a grad student at Scripps is one that I will never forget. I'm super grateful for the opportunity to have been around such great basic and translational science and in the company of great scientists. I just want to give a special thank you to my family and friends that have supported me in all of my educational pursuits. So a very special thank you to my mom, Robin, and my two sisters, Courtney and Alexis, as well as my extended family and friends. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ashok Dennis from the ISCB department here at Scripps. 
Uh, it is my distinct pleasure uh, today to present and congratulate Anthony Mellon, a graduate student uh, from my lab. Uh, Anthony received a bachelor's in arts uh, in uh, chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and there he did some very interesting research in Carlos Bustamante's lab on co-translational protein folding, as well as had other research uh, experiences at Illumina and uh, as well as Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. He then did a short stint uh, helping open a new lab at Johns Hopkins University and then joined Scripps for his PhD. He joined my lab in 2016 for his PhD. Uh, Anthony started work on a very exciting uh, new area in uh, biophysics and biology, uh, also in the uh, new area in the lab on liquid-liquid phase separation uh, of RNA and proteins. Very important, uh, a lot of people are realizing this in cell function and misfunction and disease. Uh, so Anthony, along with other people in the lab, took a very strong biophysical and physical chemistry mechanistic approach to this problem. So he, uh, his work resulted in lots of interesting new results, including uh, showing that uh, you can have a complex non-monotonic dependence on relative concentrations of the RNA and proteins uh, with lots of important implications for cell biology and disease. Uh, over the past couple of years, he has also been co-mentored by Professor Lisa Rocky, uh, my colleague, uh, working on an exciting area of polyphosphate phase uh, separation, which is important in antibiotic resistance in bacteria. Overall, his work has provided new insight in the area, showing how fundamental mechanistic uh, understanding can have a wide impact. Anthony Van Arks and Baxter Fellowships during his time at Scripps, and now he has been selected for a prestigious uh, Vertex Fellow position where he will go next to work on drug discovery. Congratulations, Anthony, and I wish you all the best in your future. During my time at Scripps Research, I had the privilege of working with several phenomenal scientists as well as people. First off, I am deeply indebted to my mentor, Ashok Dennis. He played a foundational role in my development as a scientist as I transitioned from chemistry to biophysics to studying mesoscale phenomenon. I would also like to thank my other mentor, Lisa Racky, who helped push me out of my comfort zone and challenged me to approach problems from various perspectives. I am extremely appreciative to have both Ashok as well as Lisa during my time at Scripps. I would also like to thank my lab mates who supported me through thick and thin and enriched my time during grad school. Aside from people at Scripps, my wife, Jess, my mom, Carol, my dad, Nicholas, and my sister, Alexandra, have continually supported me both physically and emotionally. I am grateful for having such a loving and wonderful family and I would not be here without all of you today. It's my great pleasure uh, to present and congratulate uh, Paolo Onacic, a graduate student from my lab. Paolo received a Bachelor of Arts in uh, Molecular and Cell Biology from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, during this period, he carried out research on protein folding in Susan Marcusi's lab, and then subsequently did a stint research stint in George Phillips' lab uh, at Rice University. He then started as a graduate student at Scripps and joined my lab for his PhD in 2016. Uh, Paolo started work on a relatively new project in a lab uh, on the rapidly expanding area of liquid-liquid phase separation uh, in cells, uh, important for function and misfunction. Uh, using ensemble and single molecule methods, uh, he his work has provided new mechanistic insight uh, into understanding, uh, basic understanding of this process. Uh, one key finding was that quite simple changes in divalent cation concentration, uh, which are very relevant to many processes in cells, can give rise to complex non-monotonic changes in peptide RNA phase separation, including a dramatic transition to droplets composed of RNA and uh, the divalent cations, and excluding the peptides or proteins. Uh, such findings of complex input-output relationships of these droplet species have substantial implications for biology and disease. I also note that Paolo is an excellent mentor. Uh, for example, he really enjoyed 
explaining a research to others in the lab, uh, but also to visiting high school students. And the droplets that his research uh, uh, was focused on uh, was a great way to uh, explain this research. Paolo is interested in research and teaching and has a bright career ahead of him. Congratulations on your achievement, Paolo, and I wish you all the be very best in the future. I wanted to just start off here by saying thank you to my colleagues and my advisor, Ashok. They've really made my time here at Scripps a joy, but I, I really wanted to spend this minute here saying thank you to my family, starting with my uh, mom and dad, my parents. They've uh, everything I've done, everything I've achieved academically is a testament to everything they've done for me, to the foundation that they've built for me, and to the support that they've given me both emotionally and financially throughout my entire life. Um, thank you to my brothers, uh, Diego, Lucas. Uh, they've always been in my corner, uh, always ready to just hang out and I'll have a good time when, when I needed a break from work. And finally, thank you, thank you, thank you to my wife, Kirsty, and my daughter, Maya. The two of them have been such a source of joy and, and support in what has been a really difficult time. So I love you both very much and thank you so much. Hi, my name is Matt Disney. I'm a professor in the chemistry department here at Scripps Research. It's my pleasure to um, congratulate Ali Angibello, who was a uh, a student that we were very lucky to have work in a lab. Ali is, is extremely amazing. And so the amount of things that she was able to do, uh, you know, I was, I was, I, I became so surprising that I became never surprised at the things that she was able to accomplish. And so Ali, uh, despite having trained only as a chemist, was able to take molecules that she designed and synthesized and was able to test them in in mouse models of, of diseases where there's no treatment. And so part of uh, her fearlessness allowed us to really study that we could design molecules against these incurable diseases that were very selective and could very uh, potently uh, affect disease in, in, in those models. And we hope to be able to translate that into man. Another thing that Ali was able to do is uh, figure out chemical ways to get disease affected cells and tissues to make their own drugs by feeding these tissues drug precursors, which I think is a really uh, important and amazing thing. And she was able to accomplish that, um, I think, by making everything look very easy, at least from my standards being, <laughs> being far away. Uh, you know, she certainly made it look easy, and that was because she was just able to take the very difficult, if not impossible, and address that in a very articulate way. Um, you know, so I'm very blessed to have Allie uh, take the foundation of that work that she did, and now she's working uh, at Expansion Therapeutics to try to take those discoveries and really uh, translate them into affecting diseases that have no cure. And I'm really excited uh, to see what she has to do in the future. And I'm sure that the future is going to be uh, as bright as what she has accomplished in the past. So I want to also, the, the, one of the things with Allie that I also appreciated was getting to know her as a person, getting to know uh, her family. And I'm, you know, I want to share the pride that they have today and Allie's accomplishments with them. So it's really been a great pleasure to work with Allie. And, you know, I'm excited to continue to be able to do that. I'm incredibly grateful to be receiving my PhD from Scripps, and I want to start by thanking my PI, Matt Disney, for allowing me to be a part of your lab. You constantly push me to be a better scientist, to work hard, and to think deeply about my projects, and I never would have imagined that I would learn so many new things during my time in your lab. Thank you for all of your support and guidance throughout the years. Thank you to all of the members of the Disney Lab for your friendship and advice. I enjoyed working with and learning from each and every one of you. During my time at Scripps, I met some of my best friends, and I am so grateful to have had such an amazing support system going through grad school with me. Finally, I want to thank my brother, Eddie, my boyfriend, James, and my mom and dad for being my number one supporters. You guys were there for me through all of the highs and lows of grad school, and I couldn't have done it without your love and support. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to congratulate Hafiz Hanif. Uh, who's graduating today. Hafiz um, has, has been a graduate student in the lab uh, for a long time. And so he's been able to uh, 
I think, grow tremendously in his ability uh, to do science. One of the things with Hafiz that I really appreciate, and I think he's left a lasting legacy in the lab, is his, his ability to be very kind to people, to work well with others within the lab. And because of that, he's been able to do complicated things like work in collaboration with a pharmaceutical company, AstraZeneca. So Hafiz and I uh, had a project, uh, which uh, at the beginning, admittedly, was kind of strange. So AstraZeneca asked us and said, hey, Matt and Hafiz, can you take our small molecule drug collection and can you figure out a way to increase uh, VEGF expression in heart tissues? And so VEGF is a protein that's silenced when you got a failing heart and people that have heart conditions, they have a poor prognosis because once you get a damaged heart, you can never repair it. And so many of us might know about some of the technology that AstraZeneca has utilized to enhance VEGF expression. It's the same technology that the Moderna vaccine has uh, for COVID and that the other drug that AstraZeneca has approved to do this is a messenger RNA that's being delivered into heart tissue. And so what Hafiz was able to do is basically get similar activity, not with this huge encoded gene, but he was able to take uh, studies from this AstraZeneca collection and design a small molecule that in principle could be delivered as a pill that would go in and integrate in the circuits of a failing heart and get the cell to produce its own new VEGF to repair damaged hearts. And so AstraZeneca was so excited by this that they made their own video and GIF about it, which I think Hafiz and I were very jealous because they put it on their 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 website, and we didn't we didn't get, we were we were, we eventually argued, and we we were able to get uh, Hafiz and Scripps to get some credit for this, uh, but I think it's just a testament. Uh, to the important research that Hafiz could do. And, um, you know, the, the, the thing that uh, frankly gives me, you know, the most pride in Hafiz is just his ability to grind things out, do it, and do it in a manner that, despite it being very hard and challenging, was always very positive. And so the group, and me in particular, I think Hafiz's lasting legacy is not just science, but it's also the way in which he conducted doing that science, which was of the highest integrity um, and uh, a very nice team player that certainly brought people together. And so we're, you know, I'm very excited also about Hafiz. He's working at Skyhawk Therapeutics where he's hopeful to be able to take discoveries on getting molecules that can interface with RNA processing pathways that are more diverse than VEGF, but I think equally as important and bring that to uh, addressing uh, challenges that people suffer day to day and being able to uh, deliver medicines to treat, treat those challenges. So congratulations to Fees and congratulations to his family uh, that I know were an important support system along the way. My name is Kiri Ingle and I'm a professor in the chemistry department on the La Jolla campus. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce two outstanding graduates from my research lab today. First, I would like to introduce Mingyu Liu. As an undergraduate, Mingyu attended Nankai University in Tianjin, China, where his talent and passion for chemistry quickly became evident. His undergraduate research in the lab of Professor Bingtao Guan centered on fundamental cobalt coordination chemistry, and he also carried out a six-month internship at Riken in Japan, where he worked on rare earth metal catalysis with one of the legends in this area, Professor Xiaomin Hao. In 2016, Mingyu joined the graduate program here at Scripps Research, and I was overjoyed to be able to recruit him to be part of my second class of graduate students. During his PhD, Mingyu proved himself to be a dedicated, driven, and fearless researcher, pioneering a new area of research in my lab focused on the synthesis of highly substituted alkenes which are one of the most valuable and versatile classes of functional groups in organic synthesis, though one that is traditionally difficult to access with certain substitution patterns. By cleverly leveraging the unique reactivity of palladium as a catalyst, Mingyu developed two new strategies to synthesize prized alkene targets from widely available starting materials, uh, namely alkynes, or alternatively from less substituted alkenes. To solve, C to solve key selectivity control issues, Mingyu teamed up with scientists from the pharmaceutical company Boehringer Ingelheim 
And during a short internship working in their process chemistry department, he identified a tailored ligand for the catalytic cross-coupling of alkynes that offers remarkable reactivity and selectivity. Mingyu's research has already resulted in eight publications, three of which are first author contributions, with at least three more currently in, in prep. In fact, Mingyu and I just chatted this morning about one of them that we're working on, and hopefully by the time this is broadcast, I'll have a copy of that paper draft, Mingyu. Just kidding. Mingyu successfully defended his thesis in March and recently took the transcontinental journey to the East Coast where he has taken up a postdoc position with Professor Timothy Swagger at MIT in the area of materials chemistry. Mingyu, congratulations on earning your PhD and thank you so much for your innumerable contributions to my research group over the years. Best of luck. Pursuing PhD studies and school research is a fabulous experience. It's an unforgettable period of time in my life. I appreciate Professor Kerry Engel's great mentorship and the support from my family, my wife, my parents, and my friends. You all share the credit of my achievement. Next, I will introduce Van Tran. Van grew up in Orange County and attended the University of Pennsylvania for her undergraduate studies. At UPenn, Van was not only a stellar student in the classroom, she excelled in the research laboratory, publishing three papers across two different research labs, including work on physical organic chemistry with Professor Marissa Kozlowski. Van was accepted to all of the top PhD programs in the country, so we were very fortunate indeed to fend off the competition to recruit her to attend Scripps Research. And I, as a young PI at the time, was especially fortunate to be able to welcome her as part of my second cohort of graduate students. In the research lab, Van is simply put a force of nature. Her PhD research efforts spanned numerous research topics where, where she ta tackled pressing problems in catalysis, synthesis, and organometallic chemistry. Specifically, she developed a new catalytic approach for cleaving traditionally unreactive carbon-carbon and carbon-heteroatom bonds. She pioneered the three-component coupling of alkenes, organometallic reagents, and organohalides under nickel catalysis, and she developed a bench-stable, indestructible nickel zero precatalyst that has attracted widespread attention since its publication and is already witnessing broad use, including in a recent publication by the pharma company Merck. Her work has led to 19 publications with at least three more in preparation and recognition with a host of prestigious awards and honors, including the American Chemical Society Women and Chemists Committee Merck Award, the International Precious Metals Institute Giro Family Trust Bright Future Award, and selection as a Genentech Graduate Student Symposium Scholar. After recently completing her PhD and successfully defending her thesis, Van um, is slated to soon start a position as a process chemist at Gilead in the Bay Area, where she'll put her passion for reaction discovery and development uh, to use in the betterment of human health. Van, I couldn't be more proud of you and your accomplishments. Congratulations. I've had an amazing time during the past five years at Scripps, and I'm very grateful to my advisor, Kiri Engel, for his constant support and guidance during those years. I want to give thanks to all the friends and colleagues that I've met at Scripps. I also want to thank my family, especially my mom, for her support throughout these years, uh, the food that she's made for me, and her efforts to understand what I'm doing every day. Lastly, I want to give thanks to my partner, Brendan Smith, for his constant love and support. So I'm Mike Farzan. I'm the chair of the Department of Immunology and Microbiology on the Florida campus, and I'm really proud and pleased to introduce to you Zach Tickner. There's two things that I want to mention about Zach, two really exceptional properties. The first I think most people who talk with Zach very quickly learn is that Zach knows everything about everything. Uh, he can tell you about, uh, provide prof sort of interesting factoids about a range of topics, including uh, some examples that I've encountered, early Christian heresies labor union, the labor movement of the 20th century, uh, obscure elements of Philip K. Dick novels, the Fermi paradox. He loves to talk about these kind of things, and he knows so much about them. He's like a sponge of insightful information about 
a series of obscure topics. The second thing that uh, I think was exceptional about Zach is that Zach took on a project within my lab that was very different from the strengths of my lab. And as a consequence, he got in a little bit of trouble early in his PhD program. And, and from that, he received a, a good deal of pressure from his committee. And I watched this process and I um, saw what he was uh, experiencing. And I think a lot of people might have shut down or even quit under those circumstances. But Zach dealt with that with a good deal of maturity, listened to his committee, heard what they were saying, incorporated it, adapted, and came up with a PhD thesis that uh, RNA biologists, experts in the field, unsolicited, came to me and, and I praised. So I thought that was a terrific sort of testament to, um, to, to his character, actually. And uh, so I couldn't be prouder uh, to introduce you um, uh, to introduce you to introduce Zach to you today, uh, and I can't see to we wait. <laughs> can't wait to see what he will accomplish in uh, in the future. I owe my success in the Scripps Graduate Program to many people, but in particular, I would like to thank first my PI and mentor Michael Farzan, who is one of the happiest, friendliest people I know, a great mentor and a true friend. I also have to thank all of the members of my committee for their input over the years. In particular, Brian Pagel for his advice on communicating science, and especially my chair, Matt Disney, who was a true source of support in my time here while never lowering his standards an inch. I also have to thank all of my friends for providing support, those in the graduate program who understood what I was going through, and those outside of it who helped me decompress and remember that there was life before and after my time here. Finally, I have to thank my family. They have supported when I came into this world, and I'm grateful for it. Hi, I'm Stefano Forli. I'm an associate professor at Scripps, and uh, I'm here to congratulate Matt for his uh, uh, PhD. So Matt was the first graduate student that obtained uh, his PhD from our lab, so bear with me while I try to show you how happy we were uh, that he decided to join us. So Matt has a terrific background in chemistry, and um, after doing his, the first part of his PhD in the Floyd Rodensburg lab, he decided to join our lab for the remaining part of, uh, of the PhD. I was obviously happy because uh, uh, we already worked together and um, I knew he was a curious and inquisitive person. I knew he obtained very intriguing results in his past projects, but I was a little bit worried that uh, um, it would have taken him a, a while to get up to speed um, with a completely different methodological approach uh, than the one he was already proficient in. Um, but I wasn't wrong. Uh, as soon as he started working, Matt got up to speed in almost no time, and he became an active member of virtually every group meeting or discussion that was happening in the lab. Um, at some point, I noticed that half of the whiteboards in the lab, including the one in my office, back when we still had offices, um, had at least a mark he left from, um, from past discussions. Uh, the expertise in chemistry brought in the lab was essential to kickstart our COVID-19 project, in which Matt was responsible for the in silico design of tens of millions of chemical compounds that we were screening for potential antiviral inhibitors. Um, while working on the final chapters of his thesis in our lab, Matt, Matt tackled very challenging problems and he developed a new methodology to model complex and very flexible molecules. Uh, this required him to use new and cutting edge software that we've been developing. In doing so, he learned to master many computational techniques and fixed a countless of bugs, ultimately helping his uh, lab colleagues to improve the software. In fact, it was a, a bit surprising that he didn't seem to be too bothered when things didn't work out as expected. So it turns out um, that after he found out that computers kept working for him while he was asleep, unlike what was happening before in the bench in his previous um, uh, experience, Matt never looked back and he couldn't be happier. In the end, he did a terrific job, generated very valuable results and got so passionate about computational chemistry and molecular modeling that he decided to stay in our lab to deepen his understanding and explore new and uncharted territories. Uh, it was an honor and a privilege to mentor a talented person like Matt and we were very happy to have more chances to keep working with him in the future. So uh, please join me congratulating Matt for his terrific job. I just wanted to thank everybody uh, who helped make my experience at Scripps incredible. Uh, the graduate office, the faculty, my friends, my family, honestly too many people to name. I am Olivier George. I am an associate professor at the University of California, San Diego in the Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Lauren Smith worked on developing novel immunopharmacological and 
uh, behavioral pharmacologic methods for the detection of drug abuse and for the treatment of nicotine and drug addiction. She developed a novel method to detect the drug kratom in the urine that can be used by law enforcement. And she developed a novel monoclonal antibody strategy to prevent opioid intoxication and opioid overdose. She also validated um, a novel method to evaluate the effect of electronic cigarettes on behavior and the development of novel treatment. So did she developed that first model in rodents that were allowed to self-administer electronic cigarettes. She also validated the value of uh, cannabidiol or CBD for the treatment of nicotine dependence. So overall, her contribution to science has been really outstanding. She has had 13 publications during her PhD, which is uh, really outstanding. Her discovery led to novel projects in the lab that have been uh, able to be funded by public and private funding. Uh, Lauren is a very dedicated, very sharp, very smart woman. Um, she was a fantastic graduate student. She was able to secure an award, a, a Ruth Kirsten F31 award from the National Institute of Health. And she was uh, very dedicated to mentoring and to outreach during her graduate studies. So uh, she was overall uh, a fantastic student. She is now working at the, um, as a postdoctoral fellow at the Wagoner Center for Alcohol and uh, Addiction Center at the University of Texas in Austin. I'm very proud of her achievement and I'm looking forward to uh, reading our new uh, research findings. So join me in congratulating Dr. Smith. I would like to thank my advisor, Olivier George, and all the members of the George Lab who helped me throughout my <laughs> graduate school experience. Um, special thanks to Marcita and Giordano who helped me a lot on my projects. Hello, I'm Patrick Griffin. I'm chair in the Department of Molecular Medicine. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Timothy Strutzenberg. Tim joined the lab in 2016 as a talented biophysical chemist. However, he lacked experience in protein mass spectrometry and structural biology. Now he will be leaving the lab as one of the most talented mass spectroscopist that I have worked with in my career. Almost all the skills and techniques Tim developed were self-taught, including new ways to screen using HDX technology and implementing a, a improved strategy for quantitative chemical cross-linking. Tim also developed approaches to analyze these complex data sets and relate that information to biological function. Tim is a co-author on 14 papers that emerged from the lab during his time. He's first author on two of those manuscripts, and he's currently finishing up a third first author manuscript that will be in a special issue at JMB. Tim has not settled on his next career opportunity yet. However, I know he'll have many uh, strong author offers from a variety of labs, and once he takes that position and moves on, we will definitely miss him uh, as he's been instrumental in helping all the members of the lab in their structural proteomic work. And we look forward to his uh, advancements and achievements in his future, and we wish him well. Thank you. I'd like to thank my mentor, Patrick Griffin, for supporting me and guiding me through this. I'd be lost without him. I'd also like to thank the members of the Griffin Lab for guiding me through this journey. And I'd like to thank my family and friends for being there when through the highs and lows. Hi, I'm Tom Kodatik, a chemistry professor at Scripps, Florida. It's a real pleasure to congratulate my former graduate student, Paige Dixon, upon her graduation. Paige was in my lab for five years, and it was a great pleasure uh, the entire time she was here. Her main project focused on testing a hypothesis that one of the proteasomal ubiquitin receptors might be an extremely attractive target for the development of new cancer chemotherapeutics. That turned out not to be the case, but Paige did an amazing job in terms of clearing up the field and really setting the record straight uh, after a, a lot of literature and a lot of resources had suggested that uh, this could be a, a viable route to new cancer therapeutics. So she did the field a real service. Um, while she was in the lab, she also participated in a number of side projects. 
Uh, and one of those interestingly led to her now uh, career. And that uh, was participating in the synthesis and screening of DNA encoded libraries using a novel technology developed here at Scripps. Uh, she did a wonderful job in that as well, and that resulted in a couple of nice papers and some review articles, and also resulted in her obtaining a job at XChem up in the Boston area, one of the leading providers of DNA encoded libraries. I'm sure that she's going to have nothing but great things in her future. I'm very proud of Paige, and I'm happy to congratulate her upon her graduation. Graduate school is full of endless opportunities, and I'm thankful that I was able to pursue my scientific passions as well as those focused on community outreach and education. To my parents, thank you for instilling in me the value of hard work in accomplishing my goals while also enjoying life along the way. To my brother Trevor, thank you for being my best friend and sounding board. I'm so grateful to my fiancé, Troy, who's been my rock throughout graduate school. And I'm so lucky to have met some of my closest friends throughout my PhD. I will always remember the bonds that we've created. My advisor, Tom, continuously inspires me with boundless scientific knowledge and curiosity and has helped to develop that same spirit in myself. For that, I will always be grateful. Thank you, Scripps, and I look forward to what the future holds. Hi, I'm Katja Lemia from the Department of Molecular Medicine on the La Jolla campus, and today I want to congratulate Alana Chan on completing her PhD studies in my lab, <clears throat> investigating the relationship between circadian clocks and cancer. Alana has been an outstanding student. She has authored nine papers in my lab, um, including the work to which she devoted her greatest effort and passion, which will be published shortly. Um, Many epidemiological studies of shift workers have shown that um, disruption of circadian cycles increases cancer risk, but the underlying reasons for this increase is really still largely mysterious. In my lab, we study circadian molecular clocks, which um, we study the proteins that make up mammalian molecular, molecular clocks, which enable organisms to keep track of the time of day and govern daily rhythms in many different physiological systems. A protein called CRY2 is one of the necessary gears in this molecular clockwork, and it actually evolved from DNA repair enzymes. And so we're particularly interested in understanding whether CRY2 is a key molecular link between circadian disruption and altered cancer risk. And this is what Alana has been studying in my lab. In Alana's major project as a PhD student, she characterized five uh, missense mutations in CRY2 that have been reported in human uh, tumor samples. And Alana was able to show that two of these mutations are actually able to um, promote cell growth, suggesting that they might play a causal role in um, some cancers. Furthermore, Alana demonstrated that each of these two mutations that have a big effect on cell growth basically turn down the activity of a protein called P53 that is one of the most well-known proteins that uh, plays a protective role against um, the development of cancer. And based on Alana's excellent work, we now have a major new question to investigate into how CRY2 has this function um, to regulate P53 activity um, and contribute to increased cancer risk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so it's really been an honor to guide Alana through her PhD in my lab. Um, she's worked incredibly hard. And before she came to Scripps, she actually worked with a friend of mine as an undergraduate at UCLA, um, Dr. Heather Kristoff. So I knew that Alana would be really well trained and prepared for graduate school, and that has certainly been the case. Um, she's worked really hard. She's also been a valuable lab member, not only completing her own work, but also helping to keep things organized and running smoothly for everybody. Um, she recently accepted a position as a research scientist at Biometrica, a subsidiary of Exact Sciences where she'll start um, next month after um, completing her thesis defense. So in, in uh, summary, I'm very proud of Alana and of the work that she accomplished in my lab. It's been an honor to guide her through her doctoral studies, and I know that she'll be an asset to her colleagues at her new position, and, um, and I look forward to watching her on this next step of her journey. Hi, my name is Gabe Lander. I'm a professor in the Department of Integrative Structural and Computational Biology, and I have the pleasure of introducing an exceptional scientist, Mia Shin, who was a joint student with Professor Luke Wiseman in the Department of Molecular Medicine. Mia came to Scripps equipped with a strong biophysical skill set that she acquired as an undergrad at UC Berkeley, where she had worked on projects aimed at unraveling the molecular bases of protein unfolding. These studies prepared her for her graduate studies, which focus on how folded proteins became unraveled. 
During her PhD, Mia pursued numerous projects aimed at understanding how specialized machinery inside mitochondria are able to regulate protein levels in response to cellular stresses. Mia combined biochemistry and structural biology to define the molecular mechanism by which one of the key players in mitochondrial protein regulation, the lawn protease, undergoes conformational gymnastics to engage, pull, unfold, and ultimately destroy toxic proteins within our mitochondria. The seminal work was published recently accepted for publication at Nature Communications, adding to an impressive list of published studies, which include articles in science and science advances. Not only is Mia an outstanding researcher, she's also a gifted speaker, having won the top oral presentation award at our yearly graduate retreat for two consecutive years. She's also won Best Poster Awards and been selected to present her work at prestigious international conferences. She's also a recipient of several fellowships from the Fletcher Jones Foundation, National Science Foundation, and the ARCS Foundation. And perhaps most importantly, Mia always made sure that every lab function was supplied with delicious pastries and cakes. And when COVID prevented us from gathering for these celebrations in person, Mia became very well versed in the use of DoorDash to ensure that we all maintained appropriate sugar levels. I also want to acknowledge Mia's parents and her family, her husband Nathan, and all her friends within the Grace Point Church community who comprised an outstanding cheer squad for Mia over the years of her PhD and will continue to support her as she begins her new position at, Sanofi Biopharm Biopharm at the Sanofi Biopharmaceutical Company in Boston. Mia, Luke and I are both extremely proud of you and the far-reaching impact that you've had in the field. We wish you the best of luck and much more. Hi, my name is Mia Shin. Thank you so much for being here with us today at the 2021 virtual commencement. It's safe to say that the end of my PhD didn't look like what anyone might have expected, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, but I couldn't be more grateful to be here with you all today and also to have received my training at the Scripps Research Institute. I want to thank my two advisors, first and foremost, uh, Gabe Lander and Luke Wiseman. Thank you so much for the amazing mentorship and the support that I received over the last five years. And thank you so much to all the members of the Wiseman and the Lander Labs for all of your help. I really want to thank my family members as well, uh, my mom and my dad and my brother Albert, as well as my husband Nathan. Thank you so much for your unending love and support uh, throughout the way. And I also want to thank my church community. Thank you for really being my backbone uh, throughout the whole experience. And so I really want to have been here without you all today. So thank you so much. Hello. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Taylor Lowe. Okay, so let me tell you a few words about Taylor science to give you an idea of the type of scientist she is. So Taylor decided to tackle a long-standing dogma in the field of cancer biology when she was in my lab. So she decided to test whether PML was an essential protein in a subset of human cancers, and specifically whether PML in these tumors was essential to maintain a portion of DNA called telomeric DNA. So Taylor did so by using CRISPR-Cas9 to delete PML and ask whether the cells could still proliferate. So against all prediction, Taylor found that PML was not essential in these cells. And without PML, these cells were able to grow perfectly fine. And this was really important because at that point, there was a lot of um, labs across the globe that were really trying to target PML to kill these type of tumor cells. So the work of Taylor really showed that that was not the right way to do this. And we had instead to find novel targets to treat this type of cancer. And while she was in the lab, Taylor designed a lot of screens really aimed at finding these type of targets. So this really opened a lot of uh, direction in my lab, as well as many other labs across the globe. So Taylor's work was really, really important. And so, as you can see, I was really lucky to have Taylor in the lab because this type of work really allowed us to progress in our research. But overall, I think Scripps was also very lucky to have Taylor in the program because Taylor has been a really fantastic member of the community. She helped organize in the molecular biology class, she helped a lot of her peers to set up CRISPR-Cas9 editing uh, techniques in the lab. And, and overall, Taylor has been just a fantastic person uh, to meet and to interact with. So with this, I just want to say one thing. Taylor, congratulations. Uh, I could not be prouder of you. And I just want to tell as well to the rest of the class, congratulations. I would like to give a huge thank you to all of my friends and family who supported me throughout the last five years. Specifically, I'd like to thank my parents and brother Elliot, as well as my grandparents, aunts and uncles, who have always been there for me. I would also like to give a big thank you to Vince, who has been my rock throughout the ups and downs of grad school. 
Additionally, I would like to say thank you to all my friends in and out of the Smith program who have been there to celebrate my successes and overcome the challenges. Finally, I would like to thank all the amazing mentors that have been critical to my success, including my committee members, members of the molecular biology class, and of course, my fantastic advisors, Aerosol, Zerunidecki, and Nick Lottie. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Anton Maximov, and I'm an associate professor of neuroscience at the La Jolla campus. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Min Hoan, who's been doing his thesis studies in our laboratory. Min's work has been focused on wiring of inhibitory circuits in brain regions that store memory. His recent discoveries have greatly advanced our understanding of how synaptic connectivity of GABAergic interneurons is regulated at the molecular level. Min became proficient with many contemporary techniques in neuroscience, including mouse genetics, genomics, imaging, behavior, and electrophysiology. He published papers in Neuron and Nature Communications, and also his most important discoveries are not yet published. We'll hope this will uh, happen soon. On a personal level, Min is a great collaborator and a very pleasant person to work with. I'm very proud of you, Min. Congratulations. Hi, everyone. This is Min Van Speed. Talking about my experience in grad school, I would say it's not long, but fruitful. Kind of stressful, but also very satisfying. I would like to say thanks uh, to my mentor, Dr. Anton Maximoff. We always have very good talks uh, on science, and together we generate a lot of uh, great thoughts and ideas uh, on scientific discoveries. And I would like to thank all my colleagues and collaborators we made a lot of uh, progress and findings together and really enjoy this process. I want to thank my family. They are always very supportive to me and hardly give me any uh, pressure on this process. And also I would like to uh, give special thanks to my wife for long-term uh, love and support. Thank you. So I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm currently an associate uh, member of the Cancer Physiology Department at the Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute in Florida. And prior to joining the Moffitt Institute in 2018, I was an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Medicine at Scripps Research. Focus of my lab is on g decoupled receptors and the role that these receptors play in type 2 diabetes and cancer, uh, with the aim of developing novel therapeutics to treat these devastating diseases. So moving on to Tracy Bailey, uh, better known as Liz, to those who know and love her, she received a bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina in 2015. And from UNC, she joined the Scripps graduate program and in 2016 joined my lab in pursuit of her PhD. Liz's uh, PhD has not focused on GPCRs, but on another class of cell surface receptors known as transporters and specifically the monocarboxylate one transporter. Known to be a drug target for cancer, but in recent years, there's been evidence to suggest it would be a good drug target for type 2 diabetes. So although this, she has diverged from the main focus of the lab, she rose to the challenge and through her research has brought new knowledge and new technology not only to the lab but to the scientific community. She independently developed a cell-based functional assay that allows for the identification of MCT1 small molecule inhibitors without the use of radio tracing, which was previously the case. This work has been published in uh, 2019 in the Journal of Assay and Drug Development. Furthermore, Liz has recently identified a mechanism whereby MCT1 inhibition promotes uh, cell cycle and, and improves insulin sensitivity in mature adipocytes. And this work is under review in the Journal of the International Journal of Molecular Sciences. With that, I just want to add uh, what an enormous pleasure it has been to have Liz in the lab. And on behalf of myself and all her lab colleagues and uh, colleagues in the Duckett Lab, we would just like to wish Dr. Bailey the very best and great success in your future scientific career. Thank you. Graduate school has been one of the most challenging and rewarding things that I've ever done in my life. And I owe a huge thank you to my graduate advisor, Dr. Patricia McDonald. Being in your lab has been such a wonderful learning experience and traveling from Jupiter to Tampa to Moffitt Cancer Center has taught me more than I could ever thank you for. I'd also like to thank my family and friends who pushed me and encouraged me every step of the way. A special shout out to my boyfriend, Chris, and our sweet dog, Babe. Class of 2021, we did it. Good morning, welcome one and all. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to and congratulate Brett Higgins on completion of his PhD thesis work for graduation at this Scripps Research Institute graduation ceremony this morning. 
Brett joined the lab from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst after a bachelor's and then master's degree in biotechnology um, and decided right from the get-go to jump into a, a, a fundamental immunology program. Now, I can tell you that we all understand antibodies now in the, in the world of COVID and we, we realise that these antibodies come in all sorts of different flavours and have different capacity for protection, for immune protection. What we don't know and what we still don't understand fully is what are the gene programs that drive the function of the cells that make these antibodies. Now that is the focus of Brett's main project. He was tasked with the idea of understanding the transcriptional programs with single cell resolution of all these different types of antibody producing cells, plasma cells, in which he did a fantastic job. The publication that will result from this work um, will hold him in good stead. It, it's a, a wonderful breakthrough work that allows us to understand and potentially design particular types of plasma cells in the future. Now, along the way, Brett also had to develop, and we got involved with developing a new technology or a new approach to studying gene expression with single cell resolution that he coined the term QT-seq, quantitative and targeted RNA sequencing. So this, pro this, this protocol will not only impact and is, is, was essential for his own project, but actually impacts all other projects in the lab. Uh, and so all of, the, all of the, the biological drives in the lab at the moment will require this, this new technology um, to provide the resolution that we, that we need to understand what's happening. Um, let me say Brett's uh, love of hiking and prowess in, in general um, made him a co-founder of the Outdoors Club at Scripps and impacted the, the culture here at Scripps in general. Um, and let's not forget his, uh, his beer, his award-winning beer-making skills. Um, these are uh, other contributions, I think, which helps flesh out the, the uh, time here at Scripps. Um, I'd like to just say once again to, uh, to congratulate Brett and I look forward to seeing him move into the biotechnology industry where he'll apply this new knowledge base and, and skill set to, I think, the burgeoning new world of immunotherapeutics. So once again, congratulations, Brett Higgins. Thank you very much. As I finish my time here at Scripps, there are some people I'd like to thank. First and foremost, my advisor, Michael, for taking an immunology neophyte all the way to the forefront of the field. I'd like to thank Louise for her challenging questions in lab, always keeping me on my toes and her keen eye for detail. Uh, there are many late nights at lab, not all of them were successful. So I would definitely like to thank all of my lab mates for their support and their help in making lab just a great place to be. I'd like to thank all my friends I've made here in San Diego, and as well as the friends I've maintained contact with uh, through my whole time here. And finally, I'd like to thank my family so much for being there and hanging in with me this whole time. My name is Dr. Donald Finney. I'm a professor in the Department of Molecular Medicine at the Scripps Research Institute. It's my distinct pleasure today to introduce Corey Nicole Booker, who's a graduate student in my lab and is going to be receiving her PhD in biology. Corey was an outstanding student, uh, highly collegial, uh, and she's gonna be very sorely missed in the lab. I'm very happy to announce that she's accepted a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in the laboratory of Dr. Benjamin Levi, who's at the University of Texas Southwestern in the Center for Organogenesis and Trauma. So I hope you'll join me in wishing Corey much success in her future endeavors and congratulate her on her wonderful achievements. Thank you. I have so many people to thank for supporting me during my time here. Firstly, my parents for always believing in me and pushing me to take all my goals. Uh, my family and friends from back home for always cheering me on. Uh, of course, thank you to my committee, both uh, past and current members for helping push me to the end and guiding my work. I'd also like to thank uh, members of my lab for taking me under their collective wing uh, when I first joined the lab and teaching me so many things and just all around providing great conversation during my time in the lab. And then lastly, and most of all, I need to thank my PI, Don Finney, for guiding me uh, through to the end. Um, your mentorship, Don, and the time that you took with me uh, really helped me to grow my confidence and has given me the ability to take on new scientific challenges, and I'm just so grateful. Thank you. I am Satya Putanvitil, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Neuroscience. And today, I'm very excited to introduce Nadine Joseph. 
Nadine's family is coming from Haiti. She did her undergraduate from Colgate University, and then she went to University of Connecticut for her master's degree in neuroscience. She became very much excited about neuroscience research. She took up a research position in the lab of Le Hoi Sai at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I'm very glad that she chose scripts for her PhD program. And she, in my lab, she studied the role of molecular motors named kinesins in learning and memory. She discovered that a member of this kinesin superfamily of proteins named KIF3B is important for structural plasticity and memory in contextual fear memory in mice. This is, this is a remarkable finding. As a person, she is absolutely wonderful and she's a, a great fun to hang out with. She's a, uh, she's a dancer and also a singer, but she's an all-rounder. And I know she's now chasing big dreams. And a phrase to define Nadine is she's a person who never gives up. So she constantly pushed to excel, and I'm so proud of her. So I'm happy to present to you, I'm really proud to present to you, Dr. Nadine Joseph, and congratulations. I had a tough but rewarding experience as a Scripps graduate student. And I would first like to thank my graduate advisor, he really was an awesome mentor. Sathya Pudenbeetle pushed me to be a better scientist and I'm forever grateful for him. I would also like to thank my committee, uh, especially my chair, Damon Page, who always believed in me. And I would also like to, to thank the rest of my committee I would last like to thank my family members who were my support. They were my backbone through this, this journey that I took six and a half years ago. Um, I'm forever grateful. Thank you. My name is Hans Trenata. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry, and I would like to take this opportunity to celebrate and recognize the achievements of Christian Swick, who is also the first student to graduate from my lab. Christian started his graduate career at Scripps in 2015, and after a one-year stint with Professor Bill Rausch, he decided to join my lab in 2016 when I signed on to become an assistant professor here. As the first student to join my lab, Christian played a key role in getting our lab set up and ready while I was still finishing up my postdoc at Caltech. This includes coordinating key deliveries of instruments, as well as being my contact person for lab renovation. Throughout his graduate career, Christian was extremely productive and played a key role in establishing our research in the application of non-heme dioxygenases in organic synthesis, which has become one of our core programs to date. His achievements include the use of a leucine hydroxylase in C5 hydroxylation of aliphatic amino acids and its application in the chemoenzymatic synthesis of mensocytin C and caffeinophagin B, and the chemoenzymatic synthesis of GE81112 and related analogs by leveraging a variety of amino acid hydroxylases which in turn enabled the SAR elucidation of their antibiotic activity. All these efforts led to eight publications, seven of which are first authors. Safe to say that without Christian's pioneering contributions, my lab will not be where it is today. Some of Christian's defining attributes during his PhD are his tenacity, his passion for science, and his fearlessness to try new ideas. Along the way, Christian has also served as a valuable mentor to serve students as well as junior graduate students. Even after he left my lab, he has continued to serve in this role informally by mobilizing various lab members to make dank memes about a particular individual at Scripps. On a more serious note, after his graduation, Christian has taken up an industrial position at AbV, and I have no doubt that he will thrive in this role. Christian, congratulations again. We are really proud of your achievements. During my time at Scripps, I've become an expert in the chemoenzymatic tool synthesis of polyketide, peptide, and alkaloid-based natural products under the direction of Dr. Hans Renata. I've also had the distinct pleasure of being Hans's first student and helping him to build the Renata lab from the ground up. I need to thank Hans for his years of dedication and help he's given me. I also would like to thank my friends and family for all of their continued love and support of my name is Ben Shen, uh, and I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry 
it really gives me great pleasure to introduce you the newly minted Dr. Ajit Adhikari. The native of Southern California, Ajit came to us from UC Berkeley with a bachelor degree in chemical biology, co-mentored by my colleague, Professor Christopher Reda and myself. Ajit completed his PhD thesis titled Advancing the Tensomycin as Payloads for Antibody Drug Conjugates. Now, the tensomycin belong to the entire family of natural product. They really serve as a great candidate for payload molecule for antibody drug candidates for their sub nanomode cytotoxicity against the human cancer cells. So Ajit completed his PhD thesis by working on the development of a biotechnology platform for the production of designer tensomycin, the biochemical and the structural characterization of TNH methyl transferases from the tensomycin biosynthetic pathways, and the application of TNH as a biocatalyst, enabling the legal specific installation of reactive handles to the tensomycin scaffold. And finally, Ajita completed the construction of the first generation of tensomycin based antibody drug conjugates, showing great promise as the next generation of anti-cancer therapy. So Ajita really brought enthusiasm and creativity to every project he touched. Since graduation, Ajita has taken an associate scientist position in the protein discovery group at Impossible Food. Very happy to be back on the West Coast. So we are very proud of what Ajita has accomplished at the Scripps, and we really wish Ajit the very best. My time at Scripps has really helped mold me, both personally and professionally. I think going through the graduate program showed me uh, how much I know about the field, but more importantly, how much I don't know and how much we together don't know about the field and the world in general. But rather than feeling overwhelmed by the gaps in my knowledge, uh, I think being a Scripps graduate student has made me confident to be able to find the solutions uh, to, to those gaps. I think it's opened up so many opportunities and 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 privileges for me uh, after my time at Scripps. And I'm forever grateful to all of those who are responsible. I think most importantly, my mentors, uh, Dr. Ben Chen and Christoph Rader, but all of the other colleagues and coworkers that I've been, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with during my time at Scripps. And I uh, just wanna say thank you for providing the support, the infrastructure and your time uh, in helping me get to this next chapter in my life. My name is Ryan Shenvey. I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry. I have the honor of introducing the future Dr. Megan Baker, who will defend her thesis three weeks from the time of this recording. Megan is a graduate of UT Austin, where she majored in biochemistry and gained a variety of research experiences, including work on DNA damage and repair with Xiangmin Lee's group, scaffold optimization at MD Anderson Cancer Center with Richard Lewis, and natural product synthesis with D.O. Siegel's and Mike Crichet's research groups. I think this background reflects two important aspects of Megan's personality that are absolutely crucial for science and have been tremendous drivers of her research in graduate school. Megan is imperturbable and totally fearless. This combination of traits not only drove her graduate school research, but was a tremendous help for me personally, as the lab undertook some really risky research projects. When I had some legitimately hard days and looked with great pessimism on the state of research, number one, Megan was absolutely unflappable, and number two, she showed me I had nothing to fear by always generating solid data and moving her project forward. Megan worked on two main research projects during her PhD training, the first of which was the synthesis of bilobolide, a fascinating and unstable metabolite from the ginkgo tree that penetrates the human CNS and has shown protective effects against ischemia and hypoxic shock. Her second project involved the development of a photochemical cross-coupling to access CNS active small molecules from the galbulomima genus. And now one of the things that these projects have in common is that they both worked and then stopped working and this happens in science, and it's as awful as it sounds. So this is where Megan's calm persistence really kicked in. On both projects, she persisted for weeks and even months on end to identify the problem and solve it. In the first project, Megan made three key discoveries. First, she developed an enantioselective reformatsky reaction, which was catalytic in chiral ligand, the first of its kind. Second, she discovered a kinetic resolution that solved a key stereochemical problem that frustrated us for weeks. And third, she solved a late stage inside out oxidation, the very last step of the synthesis, a real buzzer beater shot from half court that ultimately allowed completion of the project. 
This work was published in Nature and then followed by an extensive investigation in JAX, including collaboration with Ken Houck, Stefano Forley, and Marissa Roberto, which combined synthesis and experimental mechanistic investigation with computation, chemical informatics, and electrophysiology, a real tour de force. More recently, Megan has helped to rescue a project from the combined grips of a pandemic shutdown and personnel departures. This project has led to a robust, robust synthesis of scarce galbulamide alkaloids, some of which cause hallucination in humans but have unassigned cellular targets. This work is ongoing but extremely powerful so far and will result in Megan's seventh paper, a pretty great tally. Megan has been recognized with numerous awards, including the ACS Merck Research Award and the prestigious BMS Graduate Fellowship, and was a Reaxis Award finalist. She'll join Merck San Francisco to pioneer their new discovery process group with Eric Ashley, the first step in what I know will be a long and productive career to develop new life-saving medicines. Megan, I am so impressed with what you have accomplished in graduate school. It's a testament to your intellect, your hard work, and your fearlessness, which I will miss tremendously, as, as will the whole group. Good luck in this next step, and please keep in touch. My time in the graduate program at Scripps has truly been really great. I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to work in the Shindy Lab. Um, I've made so many great friends over the years and met so many amazing scientists. Um, I really want to thank Ryan for giving me so many opportunities. And of course, I want to thank my family and friends for supporting me throughout the last five years. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Benjamin Huffman. Ben graduated summa cum laude from UC Santa Barbara with a degree in biochemistry and worked with Professor Javier Ria de la Nice on the electrophilic amination and oxygenation of beta ketonitriles. He spent a summer at Stanford in the Wandless lab developing a fluorescent destabilizing domain system with bilirubin and unagi, a fluorescent protein derived from, yes, unagi, that is Japanese eel. Ben enjoyed a peripatetic undergraduate experience having the opportunity to present his research in Los Angeles, San Antonio, Santa Barbara, and Cambridge. Now, Ben made three major import, important contributions to my lab during his PhD dissertation research. The predominant portion of his work concerned the unprecedented heterodimerization of butenolized to form fully substituted attached rings. That's a mouthful, so let me provide some context. In about the 1970s, a new area of chemistry started to gain traction, which was called transition metal catalyzed cross-coupling. This chemistry allowed two types of molecules that were normally unreactive to one another to form a new bond, and that bond formation was governed by a catalyst. Uh, a little like a machine that grabbed these two unreactive molecules, activated them, and then formed a new bond, and then moved on to the next pair, and so on and so on. Now, these cross-coupling reactions became extremely effective in merging simple molecules, and was so widely adapted and powerful that cross-coupling was awarded a Nobel Prize in 2010. However, these reactions became a victim of their own popularity. They worked so well that chemists used them over and over again, and the la vast libraries of compounds used for screening new drug targets were overpopulated with certain types of cross-coupling products that really were not good starting points for drugs. They were too flat, too simple, and had poor solubility. Ben discovered a reaction that could take these two-dimensional molecules into three dimensions, escape from flat land, as it were. Now, this is often a real challenge because flat molecules can accommodate one another, whereas species that are non-planar tend to suffer repulsion. The atoms start banging into one another and prevent reaction from occurring. Not only did Ben's coupling work well to produce these hindered motifs, but the reaction occurred with unbelievable speed. Occasionally, chemical reactions take several hours, sometimes even days. Ben's reaction, counterintuitively, occurred within one second at minus 78 degrees Celsius. That's negative 108 degrees Fahrenheit. One second, so fast we could barely measure its speed. We had to dilute the reaction 1,000 to 5,000 times to determine its rate. This was entirely counterintuitive. It was like watching a hippopotamus outrace a Bugatti Chiron. Ben went on to characterize the mechanism of dimerization, an arduous and seemingly interminable task, including an aggregation state titration using lithium-6, a scarce isotope of a highly reactive alkali metal, in an experiment that I'm pretty sure nobody in the history of Scripps chemistry has ever performed. These experiments were key to the interrogation and refinement of the reaction mechanism in collaboration with Kent Houck's lab at UCLA. Using this reaction, Ben was able to assemble a collection of small molecules that possess many of the same complex features as cellular metabolites. Now, one of the predictions to emerge from chemical informatics is that these features should increase the likelihood that a small molecule will bind one specific target in the cell. And indeed, in collaboration with Luke Larson's lab, Ben showed this to be the case. This, his work has identified new selective antagonists of the CGAS sting signaling pathway, and that's work we're continuing to pursue with the Larson Lab today. The graduate school differs from other types of education in that it's not a one-way street. 
I'm constantly learning from the members of my lab, as I hope they're learning from me. Ben's project really pushed our knowledge and experience into new areas, both for the lab and for the field at large. In addition to his experimental work, Ben was instrumental in helping me assemble a theoretical framework we call dynamic retrosynthetic analysis, and in particular, the application of a chemical informatics tool called a Botcher score. Ben, I honestly hope you appreciate what a major role you played in both the past, but also the future work of the lab. We're still benefiting from Ben's contributions, including a total synthesis that he completed whose key mechanism is nearly refined. Ben recently joined Denali Therapeutics in South San Francisco, a very exciting company focused on neurodegeneration. Ben, I'm really proud of your body of work in graduate school, and especially what it pretends for your coming contributions for science. So keep it up, Karate Kid, and good luck. If I had to choose a couple words to describe my experience as a graduate student, I would say that it was very difficult, but also extremely rewarding. It was difficult in the sense that I encountered a number of challenges in my personal life, as well as my research life. Um, but it was extremely rewarding because I came out the other end knowing that I could get through those challenges, both personally and in my research. And um, I really have my family to thank, as well as my fantastic mentor, Ryan Shenvey, um, for helping me through to the end. And uh, I also want to thank all of my friends that I made along the way. You guys all made my experience as a graduate student a, a lot easier. And uh, yeah, so I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you once more. So thank you. I'm Lisa Stowers, professor of neuroscience, and I'm here to present Jing Yi Chen. Jing Yi joined my lab as a young scientist eager to understand how the brain works. She had an amazing background in um, the current understanding of neuroscience and a desire to learn more about the mechanisms. And she also had a unique perspective in a sort of understanding more natural behavior than we had used in the past. And for those reasons, we settled on a project to ask about social communication, verbal communication. And it, at the beginning, it was uncertain whether our model organism mice even used vocal communication. Do they talk to each other? And can they do it in ways that have meaning? Jing Li looked at natural mouse behavior and identified that they do indeed not only talk to each other, but they scale their vocal sounds from short and quiet to loud and long, indicative of carrying social information. She then found regions in the brain that were responsible for this effective scaling, manipulated them, and understood and learned to, to identify why it was that region in the brain that was responsible for the emotional aspect of communication um, and how the brain was set up to properly scale and ha handle the changes that a mouse may, ne may need to make in order to talk to other individuals. Jing Yi, throughout her time in the lab, was a true leader. She um, interacted with others in um, ways that others hadn't done before in my lab, leading um, not only from an intellectual point of view, but also from a social point of view. Um, and we will really um, normally miss Jing Yi. Um, she, however, she's going to a fabulous lab, Michael Bruch's lab at University of Washington, where I expect that she will continue to do leading work in neuroscience and will continue to be a colleague. So for that reason, this is truly a commencement, a beginning, and um, uh, congratulations, Jing Yi Chen. First of all, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Lisa Stowers. Her passion and dedication for decoding brains and solving important questions in the field have encouraged me deeply. She has always given me full support to try anything that I came up with, no matter how impossible they sound to be. I'd also like to thank every member of the Stowers Lab, my committee members, and my fantastic collaborators. They have offered multiple critical ideas that inspired me greatly. Last, I'm deeply grateful to my friends and family for their love and support. All these years, my parents have supported me unconditionally and have encouraged me to pursue my career. My fiancé, Yu Jia, who is my sunshine and my rock, his love and company has made these years in San Diego the best time in my life. Yeah, hi, my name is John Tajero. I'm an associate professor in microbiology and immunology department at Scripps. And I'm, uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Vincent Vardabedian, um, who recently uh, is graduating in, in the current 
um, class. So Vincent um, originally hails from New York where he grew up and from following high school, he matriculated to Emory University where he got a bachelor's degree in biology. And his interest there predominantly centered around understanding cancer and, and, and developing um, cancer vaccines. And so from an early age, he had a really uh, a serious interest in, in cancer and particularly as, as, he, you know, as the years went on, immuno-oncology, which is now a, a major area of, of research in, in immunology as well as oncology. And so he, he then joined Scripps as a graduate student. And in late 2016, he joined my lab where we worked on understanding um, how viruses, particularly persistent viruses, uh, modulate the or suppress the immune response uh, to infection, which has many parallels in, uh, to, to cancer. Um, and so one of his projects was looking at certain lipids and, and modulation of uh, an enzyme called ABHD12 and how it, uh, modulation of that enzyme regulates the lipid profile in the animal and then results in better control of, of, of persistent viral infection, as well as some immune pathology, which is something that's, that's seen a lot in immuno, in immuno oncology. Um, from there, he then moved on to work on a, pro a joint project with Luke Larson's lab looking at sting agonists, a particular sting agonist that was systemic where he showed that um, these sting agonists were very effective in animal models, um, either alone or in conjunction with immunotherapy uh, treatments to suppress cancer, uh, cancer growth um, using uh, colon and, and um, uh, uh, skin cancer models. And so from here, uh, from there, he, he has obtained a position following his graduation here um, at a company called Vividion Therapeutics, who is also working on um, employing immune therapies, um, small molecule therapies for very difficult to drug targets to um, pipeline them into cancer therapy as well as autoimmune diseases. And so uh, congratulations, Vincent, you've earned it and I wish you best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. Hello everyone. My time at TSRI was marked with adversity and success. I would like to thank everyone who helped me through the lows and celebrate the highs. Specifically, I would like to thank my parents, Diana and Armin Bardavidian, as well as my grandma, Soon Morosco, who never stopped believing in me. I also would like to thank Taylor Lowe for supporting me every day for the past four and a half years. Additionally, my friends Sean Walsh, Mike Lazier, Brett Higgins, and Catherine Mayer were instrumental to my success. During my time in John's lab, I had the pleasure of working with talented scientists such as Hallie Wynn, Daniel Lazar, Natalia Gazaniga, Namir Shabani, and many others and I thank them for their support and their camaraderie. I would also like to thank my committee, Chang Chin Chow, Linda Sherman, and Ben Cravat for their support and feedback. Finally, I'd like to give a huge thank you to the one and only Dr. John R. Tajaro for sticking with me for the whole ride. Thank you to everyone. Welcome. And we're celebrating today Christian's graduation. Welcome Christian's family, friends, and colleagues. I'm gonna share with you a little of Christian's journey in science in my lab. Christian started with me a number of years ago and asked a very simple question. How can you tell and how can you sequence, that is look at the structure, the RNA structure of HIV in the blood? Some of you might know HIV is a quasi-species, that is a population. What hadn't been done until he did the experimentation and solved the question of how to do it was how to look at each of these populations of viruses one at a time. He spent his time not only developing methods on the bench, but also computational means to analyze. So it was a real tour de force. I have to say my life wouldn't have been as rich as much without him being in our group. And I really enjoyed the journey, Christian. Welcome, and I'm glad to see that you've done so well in science and all the best for the future. Thanks, Bruce, for showing me the ropes of this fascinating field of viral evolution. Thanks to my collaborators at Scripps and throughout the US, uh, advisors and mentors, formal or otherwise, that have helped me through this journey at Scripps. Thanks to my family in Argentina, family in Vancouver, and the family in San Diego especially in this uh, last tricky 2020. Thanks to Jen, my rock and my biggest fan. This wouldn't have been possible without you. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce and congratulate Sean Walsh. Sean came to the Scripps graduate program from Emory University in 2015, where he joined the lab of Floyd Rumsberg. 
Sean came to my laboratory in 2019 to complete his thesis using proteomic mass spectrometry. The subject of his thesis was the aralomycin class of antibiotics and trying to understand the evolution of antibiotic resistant and the mechanism of action of this class of antibiotics. His thesis was a tour de force of multidimensional methods using genomics, genetics, and proteomics to understand the cellular physiology of response of bacteria to these antibiotics. There are a number of different classes of aralomycins, and Sean's thesis uncovered some previously unappreciated differences in how cells respond to these antibiotics, setting the stage for future studies that might exploit this previously unknown chink in the armor of uh, aralomycins. Uh, Sean is a tremendous scientist. I'm really proud of his accomplishments. Uh, he tackled this very broad and deep problem fearlessly from a number of different angles and interpreted very complex data sets with incredible analytical skills. Uh, he's a terrific young man, a pleasure to have in the lab, and I'm extremely proud that he's gone on to a local biotech company, Primordial Genetics. He's got two first author publications and another publication, and he's got one in the pipeline, uh, including the proteomic work that he completed in my laboratory in the last year. So congratulations, Sean. Good luck with your endeavors in biotechnology. I'm sure we're going to see great things. And I want to join your family in congratulating you on this accomplishment. And I know at your virtual thesis defense, your father, Andrew, was there, and he asked a very good question. Your sister, Josie, your mom, Christine, and her partner, Kristen. I hope all of you can go out and celebrate appropriately. Congratulations, Sean. I learned a lot in grad school, and I grew. I think we all did, and that's what adversity does to you, because we all face adversity in more ways than one. And I want to thank everyone in the Rumsburg Lab and the Williamson Lab who helped me get through it, my friends in grad school and, and out who were there for me and supported me, and especially my family, mom, dad, Josie, all the rest of you watching. Uh, you know that I'm here because of you. My name is Luke Wiseman. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Medicine at Scripps Research. The next awardee, Julia Grandjean, has been a staple around Scripps for as long as I can remember. Her mother was a technician here, and I have memories of Julia as a middle school student filling pipette boxes to pass the time as her mother finished up in the lab. Even in this simple task, Julia's work ethic, intelligence, and creativity was evident. Further, it was clear, even as a middle schooler, Julia was her own person that will always find her own path to accomplish her goals. After graduating from UC Berkeley, it was not surprising that Julia decided to return to Scripps for her PhD, ultimately joining my team. In her short, extremely productive four years in my lab, Julia pursued a project focused on developing compounds that selectively activate protective stress signaling pathways in the cell. Throughout her graduate studies, Julia continued to find her own path, developing clever new approaches and experimental techniques to overcome every challenge that stood in her way of her goals. Her success in this project was evident from her substantial publication record with numerous first author publications in top journals, including a seminal manuscript in Nature Chem Bio describing first-in-class compounds that selectively activate the IRI-1 signaling arm of the unfolded protein response. However, the true impact of Julia's work is found in the application of her compounds and techniques by my lab and many others worldwide interested in probing the therapeutic potential of stress signaling in diverse models of human disease. Truly, Julia's work has left a lasting impact in this area of biology. With students, the hope is that they leave your lab having laid the foundation for the next generation of scientists to pursue their own research interests. There is no question that Julia has done exactly that, as her work has opened new doors for many of my group that will fuel projects for many years to come. Julia, I'm extremely proud of you and everything you've accomplished during your, your graduate studies, and I look forward to following your career in a new position at Protega Biopharma. There is no doubt that you continue to find the highest level of success by following the path that only you can see. Please join me, Julia's husband Jeff, her daughter Hannah, her parents, her lab mates and friends and family, all in congratulating Julia on an exceptional PhD. 
Hello to family, friends, and countless supporters who have shown you will be there to take part in this awesome celebration no matter the circumstance. My experience as a Scripps grad student has been extremely rewarding. I can't quite put into words how transformative my four years in the program were. With the encouragement and guidance by my advisor, Luke Wiseman, and support from Wiseman Lab members, I've gained the courage and capability to embark on my own journey in the scientific community. In so many ways, Scripps just put me in the right place at the right time with the right people, and it was and continues to be a pleasure to be true colleagues with leaders in fields of biology, chemistry, and beyond. But most importantly today, I'd like to thank my family from the bottom of my heart for lifting me up to be in this most privileged position. My parents have always pushed me to be my personal best, no matter the competition, and my husband for going on this journey with me. Uh, for my daughter, Hannah, I hope she may one day watch this and know that she has the same team behind her, supporting her to her future goals. Thank you to everyone and congrats to the class of 2021. Like Julia, the next awardee, Aprajita Madhavan, also followed her own path during her PhD studies in my lab. Aprajita came to Scripps following a successful master's degree at the Tata Institute in India. Despite initial success on a project focused on the regulation of mitochondria, it quickly became evident that a project wanted to pursue a thesis project focused on defining the therapeutic potential for pharmacologically activating protective IR1 signaling in obese mice. I was extremely excited about this idea. However, there was a problem. While I have experience in studying IR1, I am not an expert in obesity. Further, I don't have any experience in the types of mouse models necessary to pursue this project. However, a project would not be deterred. Instead, she did what all great Scripps grad students do when faced with these types of challenges. She went out and found a collaborator in Enrique Saez who brought the necessary expertise to allow her to pursue her research goals. Working between the Wiseman and Saez labs, a project established a collaboration that applied our IV1 activator compounds to mouse models of obesity. A project has been extremely successful in this project, demonstrating for the first time the ability to selectively activate this protective pathway in vivo and defining the tissue-specific molecular basis for iron-1-dependent regulation of systemic metabolism in obese mice. This work is described in a bioarchive preprint and currently in revision for publication with a project as first author. The ability to identify and establish collaboration between two labs during a PhD is a truly remarkable achievement, made even more so by the contributions a project has made to many other ongoing projects in my group. Her establishment of these collaboration between the Wiseman and Saez labs opened many new opportunities that are now being pursued by other members of our research teams. Further, a project has brought new experimental models and techniques to my lab that are benefiting not only our collaborative work in metabolic research, but also many other projects in my group. Aprajita, I'm sure I speak for Enrique and I and, and when I say that we're extremely proud of you and all you've accomplished during your graduate studies. You have definitely forged your own path while also paving the way for this collaboration to continue in exciting new directions. Please join me, her family, lab mates, and friends in congratulating Aprajita in a truly outstanding PhD. The past five years um, at the Scripps graduate program have been an incredible experience. Um, making the decision to move halfway across the world. I didn't expect it to be easy, uh, but I could not have asked for a better family than the Wiseman Lab um, to really grow and learn in over the past five years. Um, I have to take this time to thank Luke for being just the most supportive mentor I could ever ask for. Um, he was always available, uh, sometimes too available for all my questions um, talking about science, talking about life, and just supporting me all the way. So thank you so much, Luke. Um, and I can't let the opportunity to thank my family go. Um, they were just always supportive of my dreams and never let me settle. So thank you so much. Hello, my name is Dennis Wolin. I'm an adjunct professor at Scripps, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Angelo Solania, who is receiving his PhD in chemical biology. Um, prior to joining the Scripps Graduate Program in 2014, Angelo began his undergraduate education at Kasumne's River Community College. And in 2012, he transitioned over to UC Berkeley, where he ultimately received his bachelor's in chemistry with honors in 2014. And while at UC Berkeley, Angelo worked as an undergraduate researcher in Carolyn Bertozzi's group, making N-glycan mimetics using chemoenzymatic processes. And all of his hard work uh, resulted in a co-authorship on a publication from Carolyn's group in bioorganic medicinal chemistry. 
Angelo came right to my laboratory upon joining the Scripps program, and he was tasked with the design, synthesis, and characterization of small molecule inhibitors and peptide probes that target specific human proteases, in particular proteases called caspases, that are involved in a wide variety of very important biological processes. And so Angelo's probes will help us to determine what individual caspases do in these biological processes, and if these caspases are, in fact, drug discovery targets uh, for particular types of diseases. Angelo is moving to Genentech, where he will be joining my group again, and, and we will be looking at and trying to identify small molecule targets and drug discovery targets from the human distal gut microbiome. I want to thank Angelo for his persistence, intuitiveness, and commitment to the laboratory. And it was absolutely fantastic to have Angelo as a colleague for the last seven years, and I look forward to the next seven. Uh, so please help me thank Angelo for all of his hard work and congratulate him on this great achievement in receiving his PhD. My name is Jing Kuan Yu. Um, I'm a chemistry faculty member at Scripps. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Tyler Sandenis. <laughs> and Tyler uh, attended Columbia University where he worked with Professor Scott Snyder and completed the total synthesis of rufacinolide as an undergraduate student, which is extremely unusual. And due to his extraordinary accomplishment, he actually has won a number of uh, awards already during undergraduate study, a Rabi Fellowship, a Barry Goldwater Fellowship, as well as a National Science Foundation Fellowship. And we were fortunate to recruit him to Scripps and to join my lab to study CH activation chemistry. And during his stay in my lab, he exploited a number of very creative and exciting ideas, uh, challenging projects on CH elevation, and eventually lead to his main project in, for his PhD, exploiting enantioselective CH elevation of thioether. Uh, through his studies, we have you know, learned uh, a great deal of you know, mechanism on enantioselective CH activation. Uh, right now, he's uh, joined uh, Professor Don Tilly's lab at Berkeley uh, as a Beckman postdoctoral fellow to study the fascinating chemistry of transition metal main group complexes because he has been always interested in uh, multiple bonds between metals and main groups and to study the unusual structures and reactivities. And uh, uh, actually, just within a few months, uh, he has already made a great progress from what I can hear. So congratulations, uh, Dr. Tyler Sandenis. I would like to thank my family, my parents in particular, uh, and my friends for supporting me over the last long, long five years. It's now uh, my pleasure to confer um, the doctoral degree uh, upon the candidates by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Scripps Research and on the recommendation of the faculty of the Skaggs Graduate School in Chemical and Biological Sciences, I hereby confer upon each of you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Graduates, please move your tassels to the left of your mortar boards Congratulations, and everyone, um, please uh, join me in congratulating the 2021 class. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this virtual graduation ceremony, and I urge all of you to take your graduates out and celebrate uh, in any way that, that you can uh, to acknowledge their tremendous accomplishments. Again, we hope this is the last virtual commencement and we thank you all for your forbearance and let's celebrate.